So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. Still there, oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave? Let's give this talented group one more round of applause. Okay, before I introduce General Brown, President, CEO of AUSA and our host, I do have a few uh, administrative announcements. I'd like to start by thanking Northrop Grumman for sponsoring today's session. This new sponsorship is being offered for the first time here at AUSA, so we're extremely grateful that Northrop Grumman is the first to take advantage of it. When you have an opportunity, please take some time, stop by their booth, and visit with the Northrop Grumman team. They're located in the South Hall, booth 303. Again, a big thank you to Northrop Grumman. Let's give them a big round of applause for being today's general session sponsor. Okay, badges. Everyone in this room received our new digital access pass. Uh, this great new innovative option provided a quicker way to access these educational forums today without having to wait in line for a printed badge. Uh, we are testing this new option for the first time at this year's event, so for those of you that used it, we hope you like it. For networking purposes, though, please note that you do still need a printed badge to access the exhibit halls. So if you came in here with your digital access pass, please make sure you go and get a printed badge at the break or during lunch, and that'll provide access into our exhibit halls. For those of you that are using the digital access pass, we'd love to hear some feedback from you. So if you could flag down uh, General Haley, myself, anyone from the AUSA staff, and give some feedback, good or bad, we'd love to hear it. Proceedings, handouts, slides, and videos from our presentations this week will be available about a week after the event concludes on the AUSA website. Just go to AUSA.org, look for the Meetings tab, and look under Past Events, and you'll find our proceedings and handouts. You can also email me uh, for anything that you see during the week, and I'm happy to send them to you. App. We have a brand new app at this year's Global Force Symposium. I hope you're all taking advantage of it. It includes the latest agenda, our exhibitor lists, our floor plan, and really everything you need to access and have a successful AUSA Global Force Symposium. If you have not already downloaded the app, please do so. We've got QR codes lo located all throughout the Von Braun Center. It's easy to download. Question cards. 
I will walk around the room with question cards and take questions for our panels as time permits. Uh, I will hand out the question cards as I walk the room. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll give you a card, write it down, hand it back to me. I'll get it up to the panels. For our keynote speakers, we are uh, taking questions as time permits. For our keynotes, I'll walk around with a microphone. So please don't be shy. Start thinking about your questions now and uh, we'll give some tough questions to our keynote speakers. Press. We have press at the event, so our ground rules are simple. We are on record and for attribution. We have a lot of our good friends from the press that are here today, so on record and for attribution. All right, membership. AUSA, as you know, is a membership-based organization. Who here is a member of AUSA? Raise your hand. Yeah. All right. For those of you that raised your hand, thank you for your support. For everyone else, that was a little bit of a trick question because when you registered, unless you opted out, you became a basic member of AUSA at no cost. So thank you. AUSA now has over a million and a half members worldwide. Let's give AUSA a big round of applause for that. A million and a half members. We, of course, would like you to become a premium member of AUSA, so if you're not already a premium member, please visit with Angela Quidley at the AUSA membership booth in the South Hall foyer, just next to registration. She can review your membership plan and talk about all the great benefits that we offer at AUSA. And I think, as most of you know, by joining, you will help AUSA be an effective voice for the total army and provide support for the soldier and their families. AUSA store is also located in the South Hall foyer, not far from registration. As most of you know, we unveiled a new logo at the annual meeting, so we have a lot of great items with the new logo. We also have Duke Cannon's big ass brick of soap in case you need something for Easter. I think really nothing says happy Easter like a big ass brick of Duke Cannon soap. So make sure you visit our team at the AUSA store and we'll get your uh, Easter needs taken care of. Wi-Fi, we do have Wi-Fi throughout the building. A big thank you to our sponsor, Noblis. To access the Wi-Fi on uh, any of your personal devices, you select attend underscore AUSA, that's the network, and the password is Noblis24. Please note that is case sensitive, so it's a capital N and then Noblis24. Lunch, we will, will be available today and tomorrow in the exhibit halls. Today's lunch starts at 12 o'clock and is sponsored by Huntington Ingalls Industries. A big thank you to Huntington Ingalls for being our lunch sponsor today. I'd also like to thank all of the companies that are exhibiting with us. They are, without a doubt, an integral part of the learning process. This year we have more than 200 companies displaying the latest products and services in South Hall and East Hall. Please note that because of the weather, uh, we did plan to have some outdoor exhibits. We brought them in. They are all now located in East Hall. So if you're planning to visit any of the exhibitors that were located outside, they're all in East Hall and they're eager to say hi and meet with you. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank our sponsors for supporting this event. Simply put, we can't do what we do without the tremendous support of our sponsors. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Association of the United States Army. Let's give General Bob Brown a big round of applause. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, welcome. Hey, before we start, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the tragic accident that happened uh, early this morning, uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. And I would just ask, please keep those involved in your thoughts and prayers. There's still search and rescue going on, so please keep those folks uh, in our thoughts and prayers here uh, before we begin. But welcome. Uh, great to have everybody here. And this uh, it's going to be a great three days, I guarantee you. And, and uh, so great to be back here uh, in Huntsville, an amazing city, and uh, really appreciate the tremendous support. We're, we're really happy uh, this year, the theme, Continuous Transformation to deliver combat ready formations. So there's a, there's a lot in that, and uh, the panels will get after that, 
and we'll have a lot of uh, great discussions and I would just encourage you to uh, participate in all those you can and then on the exhibit hall as well you'll see a whole bunch of exhibits that get after that continuous transformation delivering combat ready formations you know with the world and warfare changing rapidly uh, the Army must iteratively adapt and as Chief of Staff Randy George says you know build agility into our Army uh, so critical building agility into our Army and the Army must always be ready set priorities and power leaders and reduce the complexities and these are all exactly the areas we'll cover this week uh, in our tremendous lineup of keynote speakers uh, ed educational panels and uh, fireside chats as well as the Warriors Corner which is at the Army exhibit uh, on the exhibit floor Warriors Corner always popular and great uh, great discussions going on there for sure but before we start I would like to recognize a lot of hard work uh, was put in to, to pull this together and I want to recognize the city of Huntsville and the Huntsville Convention Center there's tremendous support it looks fantastic this year a lot of construction uh, finished uh, in time we really appreciate all those efforts and uh, making this uh, just absolutely top-notch here for the for the for the show uh, also uh, the AUSA Redstone Huntsville chapter a award-winning best chapter uh, thank them for their tremendous support uh, volunteers that did so much for us we really appreciate that and of course we can't do this without the coordination of the Army leadership AMC appreciate the tremendous support and Army Futures Command uh, uh, just amazing support but for example this will be the first time ever we'll have all cross-functional teams here from Army Futures Command and that's that's incredible have all the cross-functional teams here uh, just look forward to so much getting done uh, in those areas and again thanks to our sponsors Northrop Grumman for sponsoring this morning's uh, event and the general session and really appreciate can't do it without the sponsorship that's for sure so please take advantage of the networking time we built in networking time to get out on the exhibit floor uh, fantastic exhibits and I was just talking uh, some individuals before coming in you can see more if you travel two years going to all these companies uh, you, you wouldn't even see as much as you'll see in a couple of days right here and the ideas and great discussions and educational programs so take advantage of that on the exhibit floor for sure uh, and as Alex said uh, the outdoor exhibits have moved inside so you don't have to deal with the rain so that's a good thing and I apologize I know it was uh, made things a little bit tougher this morning so now I'd like to you know we're really fortunate to kick off with our keynote speaker no better way to start uh, than with the Honorable uh, Gabe Camarillo the 35th Under Secretary of the Army uh, really grateful he's here to kick it off he's a sec senior uh, the Secretary of the Army's senior civilian assistant and principal advisor on matters related to the management uh, and operation of the Army uh, he is also the chief management officer for the Army no small tasks all those in, in that, that sentence there prior to this Mr. Camarillo served as the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Manpower and Reserve Affairs and Principal Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics and Technology. Before entering government service, uh, Mr. Camarillo's career included significant experience in law, government, national security and private industry. And he received a Bachelor of Arts in Government from Georgetown University and a law degree from Stanford University. So please join me in welcoming our opening keynote speaker, the 35th Under Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Gabe Camarillo. Well, good morning. I see from the uh, number of folks in the audience that we probably still have some folks that are getting through parking. But all kidding aside, it's great to be back here with all of you one more time at AUSA. Uh, I want to thank General Brown and the rest of the AUSA team for doing such a fantastic job of putting together this conference every year. Um, and I want to thank the city of Huntsville that always does such an amazing job of hosting us. I want to also just mention up front that, you know, the reason why these events are so important is because the dialogue that the Army has with industry is critically important. It provides a great opportunity for all of you to hear where we're headed, where we're placing emphasis in our modernization, what investments we're making, and it also provides, I think very crucially, an opportunity for the Army to hear from all of you. Hear from you about your capabilities, uh, what challenges you face, and also um, 
you know, where you all are placing bets for the future. I think what's great is, as General Brown said, is we bring so many folks uh, together from all over the country into this particular conference. So you have an opportunity to hear from us in one place and we have an opportunity to learn from you in one place. So all to say that this is a fantastic opportunity. But I do want to spend some time today talking about what's at the heart of this event, which is the two-way dialogue that the Army has with our industrial base. It's a dialogue that's been running for quite some time, and it's a conversation that I think it's important to remember is always focused on maintaining a key pillar of our national security, really since World War II. It's a conversation about ensuring that we retain our technological advantage over other peers or near peer states. And it's also about ensuring that we have the capacity to surge as needed over time. This conversation, and many of you reflected in the audience here, uh, are not just the traditional defense primes. You all also represent systems integrators, small businesses, commercial companies with a growing share of defense-related work, and not to mention, of course, the vast network of suppliers and vendors that come together to create our tanks, helicopters, advanced missile systems, and so much more. So the reason I wanted to discuss this relationship today and to talk a little bit about how we can continue to work together is because I think that we have a tremendous legacy of success and I think an important focus on how we move forward. I do believe that the conversations about the defense industrial base are poised to take a new turn. Just consider what we've observed over the past three years. First, there's a culmination of a 10-year period of emphasis on disruption and acquisition reform, focused on bringing in non-traditional suppliers in defense getting speed in our path to production from prototyping, and in recognizing that we need new processes to deal with software and software-defined systems that change too quickly for our traditional processes to work. We also witnessed a COVID pandemic that stressed our supply chains and highlighted the need for resilience in our manufacturing capacity. And then, of course, uh, when I started this job, or about two weeks afterwards, was the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which ushered in a new period of security assistance in which our industrial base and the capabilities that it produces would take the lead in our response to this act of aggression. And with the bipartisan support of Congress, we have greatly accelerated our investments in production capacity amid a resurgence in global demand for U.S. Army systems. Just consider alone that U.S. Army Security Corporation went from about $14 billion in fiscal year 22 to $35.8 billion in FY23. That's a two and a half times increase that attests to the value of our systems and how well they perform. And as the conflict now extends into its third year, America's arsenal of democracy is once more making its presence felt in global security. So in light of these challenges, though, it's important to take stock of what we have accomplished together. First, working with the Congress, we have succeeded in making key investments in manufacturing and production capacity in areas like our critical munitions. And this is followed by investments of about $3 billion in prior supplementals in FY23 that supported not only our defense industrial base partners, but our Army organic industrial base as well. Second, we've leveraged new authorities given to us by Congress, middle tier acquisition, rapid acquisition authority, and software pathway as well as other acquisition pathways have been leveraged to enable capabilities like the mid-range capability to go from an MTA prototyping effort to an actual capability that we are fielding with soldiers this next year. We've used rapid acquisition authority to buy uh, counter UAS interceptors on an urgent and expedited basis to get them to the point of need anywhere we need them around the world. 
And I think it's also really important to remember that we've done all of this while maintaining momentum on one of the most ambitious modernization efforts that the Army has ever undertaken. Modernizing several platforms across key warfighting portfolios and actually getting success in fielding them. Examples like the next generation squad weapon, the aforementioned mid-range capability that provides the ability to engage maritime targets from land, the AMPV, the M10 Booker, all of these systems are getting to the point where they are being fielded or they are in full rate production and we are delivering on that promise. Of course, we can't do any of this without the funding and support from Congress. And I do want to thank our supporters on Capitol Hill for passing the FY24 appropriation this last weekend. Where's General Brown? General Brown. I bet you never thought that both AUSA conventions would come down to the wire, the threat of a shutdown. Yet here we are. If for no other reason, we have to pass appropriations on time to make sure that this man's blood pressure can be stabilized. <laughs> but all kidding aside, the FY24 appropriations will provide critical funding in key areas that will allow the Army to continue to invest in key capabilities. $23.7 billion in procurement, $17.1 billion overall in Army RDT&E. It will sustain Army modernization with key investments that I would point out include our multi-year authority for Gimlers in PAC-3, over a billion dollars for Patriot in PAC-3 MSC interceptors, almost a billion dollars for Gimlers, over a billion dollars in continued development of the long-range hypersonic weapon, procurement of the MRC, and a little shy of $4 billion in the appropriation for combat vehicle programs, including over a billion dollars for Abrams, Stryker vehicles, Hercules, Bradley, the Joint Assault Bridge, and other critical investments in that portfolio. Looking ahead, I was very pleased earlier this month to be able to roll out the Army's FY25 budget submission. And it builds on the 24 budget in some critical ways. It will continue our focus on modernization with a combined request of $38.5 billion in RDT&E and procurement. It will enable us to buy new counter UAS systems continue to buy the multi-year procurement of Patriot and Gimlers, and deliver increment one of the precision strike missile, which is our ATACMS replacement. And it sends a strong demand signal to industry on critical munitions, requesting new production funding for CH-47 Block II, a new multi-year for UH-60, and a newfound emphasis on tactical UAVs. The reason I bring this up on the heels of enactment of 24 is because we need Congress to pass this 25 budget in a timely fashion. As we have learned this last year, without the budget, we will not have the ability to start key programs, and we will not be able to implement changes and shifts that are required by changing conditions on the battlefield and emerging technology. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention there's one more piece of unfinished business, and that's the pending supplemental legislation that is currently pending in the House. It contains critical industrial base investments needed to fully address the Army's needs. $3.1 billion that we're waiting on to invest in production capacity of both 155 artillery and Patriot production lines. As I've said in other contexts, the Army is currently cash flowing ongoing operations costs to include our support to NATO allies in Europe and CENTCOM AORs to the tune of about $600 million so far this year that would be funded if we got a supplemental. And then of course it would provide replenishment funding to replace equipment and munitions that have been provided to Ukraine. One good example of this. We all know that the threat of, counter, or count, of small UAVs is real. The need to be able to procure and adapt counter UAS systems on an ongoing basis is vital. With the supplemental, 
we would need to get another $150 million in that legislation to be able to procure additional interceptors to be able to meet those requirements urgently uh, on the battlefield today. So I know I don't need to explain all of this to the people in this room, but these investments are not only vital for us, but they are really vital to all of you as well. They will create demand for US systems. It will provide uh, resources, revenue, and most importantly, create jobs across the network of all of our domestic suppliers here in the United States. That's everyone from large traditional defense primes to small businesses and non-traditionals. And clearly, it will provide the Army upgraded capabilities through those replenishment funds. So I hope that Congress will act quickly to give the Army and provide the capabilities that we need. This is why Under Secretary of Defense Bill LaPlante referred to production as deterrence recently. Because winning the conflict is not just about what you have on day one of the conflict, it's about what you can bring to the battlefield at the end of the first month, into the first year, into the second year, and beyond, as we've learned. So we've made tremendous progress in increasing our production capacity across the Army and achieved success in showing that we can develop and field new systems. But the landscape continues to evolve and shift as quickly as technology does, at an increasing pace, and our adversaries continue to innovate as well. So I mentioned earlier that we come off of about a 10-year period of acquisition reform that really focused on two things, making it easier for the department to buy commercial technology and getting from prototyping to production a lot more quickly. All of the reforms have enabled us to do this, and it's translated into a significant amount of success. I would argue that we have had more change in the way that Army acquisition works in the last five years than we did in the prior 25 years. But in order to retain our competitive advantage, we have to focus on what we need to do over the next five years. And ensuring that the Army and our industry partners can deliver for our nation will require answering a new set of challenges. And the questions, I think, have evolved. For an example, it's no longer just a question of whether we can do business with commercial or non-traditional vendors. It's how do we integrate the innovation that they provide in an ongoing way. The challenge now isn't just getting access to innovative technology. It's a challenge of how do we adapt our processes to ensure that we can continue to receive the benefit of those ongoing innovation cycles well after we start procuring new systems. All of what I'm talking about will put pressure on our current incentive structure. Vendors, both new and established ones, rely on the certainty of production contracts to offset investment costs in the development of new warfighting technologies. This is where that development in R&D pays off, and it allows the industrial base to plan for sustained revenue and high margin returns over time. At the same time, the iterative technology refresh cycles, particularly in areas where there are strong commercial markets, think software, small UAVs, make it very hard to ensure that the Army keeps on buying the best stuff. In some of these cases, new market players and new solutions appear more quickly than our processes can keep up with. One example I'll point out is IVAS, our integrated visual augmentation system. We initially planned several years ago on fielding a capability to the entire army at once, but we needed to account for continued improvements in both the software and the hardware integrated into that capability. So we restructured the program. It will now field in waves with soldier feedback continuously incorporated and enabling rapidly iterated designs. It's one example where you have to think not just how do you get to production, it is what happens after that. How do you continue to adopt and, in, and embrace innovation well after those production cycles have started? And the threats 
that are posed by near-peer competitors and lessons learned from Ukraine show that accelerating our buying cycles isn't just an opportunity that is born by technology, it's actually now a necessity in order to remain competitive. Now, let me be clear. There are still large systems that we will still buy and field incrementally across the entire army in the traditional pattern. But for some capabilities that we need, those buying models will not get us what we need quickly enough. But the good news is that we've started changing some of our approach and innovating the way that we acquire them in critical areas. I always like to point out, this started out several years ago with our tactical network, where we began developing a tranche by approach through capability set fielding where vendors would compete for successive lots of production, and we would enable those uh, team of vendors to be able to continue to iterate and upgrade capabilities over time. And we had about a two-year cycle. Another example is small commercial UAV systems. We've innovated the buying models there to keep pace with the rapid rate of innovation. For example, using more capability-based requirements and multiple award task order contracts, to ensure that multiple vendors can keep innovating and compete for task orders. But at the same time, for example, on the UAV side, we recognized that some of our lower level units needed some ability to start experimenting with small UAVs to inform their TTPs, and we wanted to encourage that and make it easier. So we added some of the COTS level UAVs to our uh, contracts and created an easy pathway for units to buy UAVs that are NDAA compliant, we refer to that as the blue list, uh, to be able to get them in the hands of these soldiers for experimentation much more quickly without having to do a whole full competition. We're exploring ways to drive adoption of these systems much more iteratively and adapt our processes to be able to match the pace of need. All of this shows, though, that our innovation challenges aren't technical. They really are institutional. We need to work with all of you as we both learn how to adapt our processes and become much more creative in how we structure our approach. I always like to point out that the reality is that our processes are designed around two relatively fixed constraints. The first is the two-year appropriations process, and second, the limits of how long it takes to run the competitive contracting process, which you know, is required by law. We can work on flexibility in both of these, but in reality, we have to design strategies for a subset of the capabilities that we need that utilizes creative approaches around both of these hard constraints. I know that most of our industry partners that rely on traditional buying models might think that some of this is a big shift. Some programs you know, may only be profitable once you achieve a large run of production over uh, several years. But if the Army is going to keep changing its technologies, and if it's go going to adopt new innovation, we need to ensure that there is incentives in place to continue to invest in the, in the new generation of capabilities that we need. Changing our buying models is really not just a luxury, it's actually an imperative in order to deliver the warfighter what they need. And we understand that as we look ahead to the future, we have to be good partners with all of you to ensure that industry can make an appropriate profit and remain resilient. And it's a two-way street and a conversation we are continuing to have to ensure that we find creative ways to allocate incentives to achieve the outcomes that we both rely on. And we'll do a lot of market research, have a lot of dialogue with industry in those particular areas where this need is most acute. And don't get me wrong, there, there will be changes on our part as well. Uh, I mentioned before that you know, there's a quiet revolution in the Army when we realize that for some of our capabilities, we don't have to field it to the entire Army. We can field different capabilities to different types of units and different formations over time. I also think that as we look at smaller production quantities of certain items, we have to be willing to accept higher costs in order to keep pace with the investment required to upgrade them. All of this, for some, could be new and it could be uncomfortable, 
but I think it can definitely work. And there are significant upsides, I think, both for industry and certainly for the Army to adapting our buying models to keep pace with the changes that I've described. So before I take your questions, I, I wanted to highlight just a couple of examples of how we're changing ourselves to adopt that innovation and how we're learning from best practices from industry. On some of our key uh, platforms, we are now separating both the hardware and the software baseline of our programs and competing them separately. A good example of that is our recent award for Titan. The RCV would be another example where we're looking at those refresh cycles differently. Secondly, we're changing our policies to adapt to this pace of technological change. Secretary Warmoth announced earlier this month a new software development policy that comprehensively changes our approach in the Army to buying software and software-defined products. It promotes faster, more flexible acquisition processes that include everything from requirements generation to sustainment. And some of the key tenets of the policy include establishing, for example, a new contracting center of excellence for digital capabilities at Aberdeen with expertise in the types of contracts that are needed for software, reciprocity of industry test data so that we don't recreate it at significant cost and time, and my favorite is authorities to operate, ATOs as they're known in the industry, uh, promoting much more reciprocity within the Army. So the idea is you don't have to get authority to operate from one part of the Army and then go seek it again for several months from, the, from another one and requesting that kind of uh, reciprocity across DOD. And changing the way we buy. For example, utilizing more vendor demos in source selection, not just relying on written and oral submissions. And also, of course, bringing in more software development expertise in the Army. We can only be as good of a buyer as we have expertise in those particular capabilities. And then, of course, I want to also point out that we will continue to work with industry on doing market research and exploring alternate ways of getting where we need to go. As a service buying models is one I've talked quite a bit about. And we'll continue to do research on radio as a service, looking at our mission command capabilities, uh, modeling what we've done already on the SATCOM terminal side, where we're no longer buying individual terminals, we're paying for it on an as a service basis. And we're experimenting with similar models in other areas, like counter UAS on for fixed sites, where we're thinking about that as another area where we'll look at an as-a-service um, buying construct. We're going to keep building on the successes we, we, we've had, and we're going to implement and change policy as needed to keep pace with change. But it will require a strong partnership and continued collaboration from all of you. There's many things that have to be figured out, I think there uh, are a lot of questions at this point and only a few answers, but the important thing is that we're gonna do this in a dialogue with industry, and we look forward uh, to meeting that challenge head on. Of course, if we don't succeed, the challenge is that we will not be able to give our soldiers the capabilities that they need at the moment that they need it. And the reason we're here talking with all of you and the reason that this relationship has been so successful is for decades, we have never faltered in that task. I look forward to continuing that legacy of success, and I now look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary. Yes. Secretary. Dave Lockhart, uh, uh, really appreciate your remarks and comments. It covers a lot of ground. And, uh, you know, a as you cover this, this gigantic space that's Army and all the challenges, and then we will often ask a question about something, it almost in some cases seems inconsequential, right? But the one I would like to ask relates to something that you talked about, about policy changes. And I noticed that uh, we've got policy changes associated with uh, 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 innovation, uh, policy changes associated with working with allies. As a matter of fact, Army Futures Command recently put something out uh, on Fed Biz Ops to leverage uh, foreign investment, foreign technology, and sharing of information. And so policies that happen at a level, how do we 
as we engage at both the higher levels and the lower levels when we identify disconnects between policy and execution, how do we get at those in a way that, that, that doesn't necessarily negatively impact the folks that are executing because they're just trying to do their jobs and, and, and bring that full circle, if you will? Uh, it, how, how do you create a pathway to clean those out such that policy and execution are a little bit better aligned? Thanks, Dave. Um, it's always a challenge, especially with an institution as large and as diverse as the United States Army. Um, there's always going to be a challenge in getting policy changes to get down to the execution level. I think that it requires two things. I think first, we really do need to hear from industry about acute challenges, sticking points, barriers that you all encounter. And I think we need to hear it at every level, you know, not just from the, you know, the contracting officer uh, all the way up to you know, the more senior folks, uh, to include Secretary Bush, who's sitting here in front, myself, uh, you know, other folks uh, that have the opportunity to effect the policy changes that are required. I think the second thing is, uh, and I've, I've really tried to do this, for example, in the area that we just talked about in terms of software, is to align domain expertise at the point where you're actually executing this. It's one thing to understand how to do software contracting a little bit better, but to have it be done you know, all over the Army by every contracting organization would be very challenging because there are some organizations that their expertise is in contracting in combat vehicles or in installation services, for example. Uh, so having, for example, a digital contracting center of excellence in Aberdeen where you can concentrate that expertise of what's required by that vendor base, uh, I think is a good step in that direction. So we'll look at other areas to make sure that we have the requisite expertise dealing with those types of execution challenges. Uh, so hopefully that will set us up for success. Thanks. Sir, this is Sergeant First Class Clements. Yes. Uh, so I'm all into AI and thinking deep into rabbit holes. And one of the things that you're talking about makes me ask this question. At what point in time do you have individuals that are in a uh, mathematical professional trader mindset, right, to do the projections of this is going to be the high point based off of, let's say, Elliott Wave or the Fibonacci or whatever pattern analysis system that they use, along with based off of, hey, we now, we now have this new system that we can do uh, like quantum computing, whatever, to basically come to say to the conclusion, at this time frame, this will be the high point, and then we gotta figure out how to adjust from the high point, and then figure out what the new low point's gonna be after that. And based off of the budgeting and the pricing of the incentives for the research and development, to see how from the military side, to compensate for the low, to compensate for the high, and to find an equilibrium. If you have any professional uh, financial advisors, I think maybe the best way to say it in terms of how that would be forecasted, sir. No, I thank you very much for your question. It, it's, a, it's a compelling argument. Uh, how do we follow the, the technology cycles um, effectively, especially when we have limited resources in order to place bets? Uh, I'm a believer in the fact that, you know, certainly I'm not in a position to be able to, you know, pick what those technologies are. There are many better expert people in the Army who are empowered and uh, trained to do that. But I think one of the great things about what I'm talking about is it should be fairly obvious in what subsets of our weapon systems and our capabilities lend themselves to that type of analysis. And the good news is a lot of that technology is mature, it's extant today, uh, and the, you know, the only thing slowing us down is our ability to put the resources on the right contract and be able to make those pivots and shift as quickly as we need to. So I think identifying the technology won't be the challenge. It is, again, just getting our processes to work very effectively in order to get us there. And, and you know, we are very much uh, you know, open to full and open competition from every vendor, every source. Uh, so I think that as mature technologies come to bear, they should make themselves pretty much uh, available to the Army. We should know where those, where those right bets are to place. Next question. Yes, sir. William King back up here in the back. Straight front of the area. Yes. 
Yes, sir. As you pointed out, this is a technology-driven world, and the, and the reliance on data and access to data is driving a lot of the innovation where we see going today. How is the Army embracing that from an institutional perspective and taking advantage of the innovation labs that are in industry, as well as what uh, Army Futures Command is doing in creating their innovation labs to bring warfighters into those environments for brief periods of time, one, to get exposure to what's in the realm of the possible, but two, to get that direct feedback and then get it back out into the force, since, like I said, that is what's driving our future capabilities. Yeah, it's a great question that I'll actually expand it a little bit further. Um, you know, I go back to maybe about 10, 12 years ago, uh, there was a very rigid set of relationships between the Army and industry. I was here in ASALT at the time. Um, you know, we felt that, you know, the conversations had to exist primarily uh, in the context of industry days, uh, you know, kind of through the contracting process. Uh, and now I think you'll see that the conversations and the dialogues are much more um, free-flowing and I think much more diverse. Um, part of that has been the emphasis the last several years on involving our soldiers and our formations into the experimentation with technology. Uh, I think that's played a very valuable role in helping us to get things right. Uh, I think it is a standard way that we're going to do business moving forward. I think the other part of it is um, doing a better job of understanding what investments industry is making. Uh, and I think that you know the way that uh, we have worked across the Army between ASALT and Army Futures Command with the CFTs has done a tremendous job of that. Uh, and I know you're going to hear a lot from General Rainey uh, over the course of this conference about uh, human machine integrated formations. But it's a lot about doing exactly what we just talked about, which is bringing the best of breed of what industry has, give, putting it in the hands of soldiers, letting us figure out how to employ it, how to use it. Uh, not only will that help us to figure out how to place our bets and place our investments, I think what's great is, because I've also been on the industry side, it is understanding how is the Army going to utilize this technology? In what particular con-ops? You know, what are the constraints with the way it's currently configured or designed? That feedback for all of you as an industrial base will be incredibly valuable as well. Because the thought here is that it's not a static, you know, one or two way transaction. It is an ongoing set of relationships. And as I've said many times, a set of technology refresh cycles that we need to work on together. Sir, thank you for being thank here. You. Let's give Secretary Camarillo a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you guys. Well, what a great way to start and uh, encourage and thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, tremendous words and, uh, you know, it makes me realize we're, we're really getting closer than ever before to getting our soldiers exactly what they need, the technology, the equipment, uh, better than ever before so they're prepared for whatever they may face and uh, that's absolutely critical. So thanks, uh, Mr. Secretary, for those opening remarks. You know, for all the credential media here, there'll be a media roundtable uh, with the Undersecretary in, in Section 1. Uh, right after this. So the exhibit hall is now open, and I would encourage you to uh, take advantage, again, of some tr tremendous uh, technology, uh, great networking that will go on there, uh, and, uh, and take advantage of that and get out to the exhibit hall for sure. We're going to uh, grab a quick cup of coffee, come back here for the first panel at 945, and uh, special thanks again to our sponsor, Tritium, for the refreshment break outside. So we'll see you back here at 945. Uh, for the first panel. Thanks. Good morning, and welcome to the first panel of this conference, Delivering Precision Sustainment in Support of Ready Combat Formations. I am Susan Hawkins, Director of Strategy and Mission Solutions at Northrop Grumman, and I'm honored to be with you today. Northrop Grumman has been a proud sponsor of AUSA for over 20 years. We value the relationship building and communication these forums provide, and we are stronger as a nation because of this. We have an ongoing partnership with the Army in solving the hardest operational problems whether it be providing space-based intel at the tactical edge, building an integrated missile defense framework, or making the aviation fleet simultaneously lethal and survivable, we at Northrop Grumman 
are intensely proud of the capabilities that our partnership has created. And we continue to build with you into the future, including in areas of sustainment. The words that call out to me in this panel title are precision and ready. The synonym for precision is exactness. And you have to ask yourself, how can one be exact with a sustainment in a vast AOR? Precision sustainment to support readiness requires a full life cycle view of the capability across all phases of implementation. Who, how, and when sustainment can be performed is dependent on decisions made in each phase of the life cycle, not simply at the end. I look forward to hearing what our esteemed panel members will share with us today. It's my honor to introduce Major General Retired Clark LeMasters. Major General Retired LeMasters is a consulting employee and former Vice President and Managing Director for the Lidos UK Logistics Division, responsible for a six and a half billion pound logistics commodities and services transformation program within the UK Ministry of Defense. Prior to joining industry, Major General Retired LeMasters held many leadership roles in the U.S. Army. He retired in 2018 from commanding the U.S. Army Tank, Automotive, and Armament Life Cycle Management Command, and prior to that was the Logistics Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations and Logistics, U.S. Army Materiel Command. Major General Le Retired LeMasters served our country overseas in Germany, Iraq, Qatar and Afghanistan during his career. But before the panel begins, I would like to welcome Lieutenant General Chris Mohan, Deputy Commanding General, United States Army Materiel Command, to the podium for a few words. Well, good morning, everyone. And I would say uh, welcome to uh, sunny Alabama. Not so much. So I, I really want to say thanks uh, for joining us in this very important discussion on how our Army, along with our industry partners, will continue to deliver precision sustainment in support of ready combat formations. Before I share brief thoughts, I want to thank our panelists, and I know all of them uh, very well, and we're going to have a great panel. Uh, Major General Michelle Donahue, uh, the Honorable Sean Manasco, Dr. Chris Hill, teammate from AMC, Shane Upton, my neighbor, and of course, my moderator, and at one point, uh, mentor, uh, Lieutenant General, retired LeMasters. We shared a lot of good time out at, uh, at NTC together. Um, and I think both of us probably flinch on that, uh, some of those memories, but they were good memories. This is a phenomenal panel with decades of experience in both leadership and sustainment. And I know that they have some very valuable information to share about our ongoing transformation efforts and our, our efforts to develop a lean, agile, and resilient logistics capability. But to frame this very specific discussion within a larger scope, I want to share a few comments that the chief made a, a few weeks ago when he met with the Defense Writers Group. He opened up his talk by saying that the battlefield is no longer local. The interconnection between everything that we do from space to cyberspace has already transformed how we will fight the next large-scale ground combat operation. You've heard us often talk about the Joint Strategic Support Area, that that's everything back here where we generate, project, and sustain combat power. This area is, as we all know, is a key center of gravity for our nation's military forces. But the battlefield is no longer local. It stretches from the Joint Strategic Support Area all the way down to the tactical edge. And so we know that this, the Joint Strategic Support Area is going to be under pressure. It's going to be under pressure from our own adversaries, from benign characters, from criminal enterprises. And so over the past 20, 30 years, we have had the exceptional ability to move in and out of theater, almost at will. and and we have to ask ourselves, is that, is that the way it's going to be in a future combat uh, scenario, in a future combat uh, contested, or in a future combat scenario? But then the chief also said that no matter what, this is going to be a contested environment. 
So we know that sustainment in the future is going to be definitely contested. And it's going to be contested, as I said, across every stage and every domain, land, sea, air, cyber, and space. We should expect that our operations, our facilities, and all of our activities will be targeted, detected, disrupted, whether here in the homeland, in transit, or in theater. So how, do we, how are we going to remain successful in such an environment? And we must, that means we must transform the sustainment warfighting function. And modernization is more, about weapons, more than about weapon systems. We must transform and modernize the sustainment warfighting function, including infrastructure, training, processes, and skill sets necessary to support next generation warfighter capabilities. Part of this is translating battlefield lessons learned into actionable innovation now. We must work closely with our industry partners to ensure that the defense industrial base remains postured to be responsive, capable, and can maintain pace with our efforts. Think about this. If our adversary or us can fly a UAS with a precision munition, we should be able to fly a UAS with precision sustainment, either a crit critical repair part that is necessary to generate a combat sortie or a critical load of munitions in order that is necessary to prosecute a high-value target. We, almost, we, we must also operationalize data so that we can predict what our forces will need and then provide it with precision on the battlefield. And we must exploit, exploit advanced manufacturing capabilities, autonomous capabilities, robotics, and new methods of storing and using energy. All of these efforts combine to reduce our overall logistics tail while increasing the speed and accuracy of sustainment. That is how we will remain successful in a contested environment well into the future. We've come a long way in those, uh, in those endeavors, but we've got a long way to go. But with your help and our continued partnership, I have no doubt that we will continue to, to deliver precision sustainment in support of ready combat formations. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and thank you for your continued support of, this, of our great profession of arms. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, our panel. Thank you. Well, great, uh, General Moe, and thank you for those very appropriate comments and uh, what a great setup to this uh, panel that I hope you're all as excited to hear uh, and learn about as I am. Uh, so just some administration. We'll do a quick introduction to our panel members. Uh, our panel members will each have uh, some brief opening remarks, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers, and I know that'll be the the, the exciting part of the panel where we're really going to learn uh, some new things. So without further ado, let's get on to the most important part. Uh, Set it to my right are our great panel members, uh, Major General Michelle Donahue, the current commander of the Combined Arms Support Command, Sustainment Center of Excellence in Fort Greg Adams. She took command December 14th of this last year. During more than 27 years of service, Major General Donahue has held many key command and staff positions and provided sustainment support to, at the tactical, operation, and strategic level, affording her many unique opportunities and experiences in the area of sustainment. As you all know, CASCOM and the Sustainment Center of Excellence is dedicated to educating, training, developing adaptive sustainment professionals for the total force while generating, synchronizing, and integrative innovation for both the Army and Joint Sustainment Capabilities, Concepts, and Doctrines. That's a mouthful. <sighs> CASCOM is also helping to ensure that the Army can sustain large-scale operations and multi-domain operations is key to the discussion on precision logistics and the contested logistics and the support uh, to joint and multinational partners in 2030 and beyond. General McDonough, welcome to the panel. Uh, our next uh, panel member is Dr. Chris Hill. Uh, Dr. Chris Hill is the Chief of Data and Analytics at the Army Materiel Command. Dr. Hill was appointed in May 2017, and as the Director of the Army Materiel Command Analysis Group, Dr. Hill is the Principal Assistant to the Commanding General for Analysis and Study and is responsible for ensuring credible, timely and independent strategic level analysis of material life cycles, logistics, systems, 
modeling and simulation, and data su to support equipping, sustainment, and warfighting decisions. Dr. Hill also serves as the command's chief data and analytics officer and is responsible for execution of data and analytics activities across the entire command. I also want to mention uh, the that he has had a team forward in Europe since the summer of 2022, providing predictive logistics support to the Security Assistance Group Ukraine and Ukrainian military. Dr. Hill, welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, many of you know our next panel member. He's your best friend when it comes to congested logistics. Uh, Colonel Shane Upton, the director of the Contested Logistics Cross-Functional Team, located here uh, at Redstone Ar Arsenal. The Contested Logistics Cross-Functional Team was formed in 2023 to address the need to sustain the force and equipment quickly on the future battlefields, including those disparate and dispersed across multiple domains and close critical sustainment capability gaps. During an interview, General Rainey stated that the team will be focused on the division and below aspects of all things that have to do with contested logistics. And inside his portfolio are four major areas, precision sustainment, human machine, integrated supply and distribution systems, advanced power, leveraging new technologies, and demand reduction, utilizing many capabilities that we'll talk about today. Colonel Upton has also recently been nominated for and approved for appointment to Brigadier General, so congratulations, Shane, to that. Well earned. And last but absolutely not least, uh, the Honorable Shane Mancuso, uh, currently a senior uh, consultant and counselor for Palantir Technologies, focused on advancing leading edge software to meet U.S. government involving and complex needs. Uh, Mr. Mancuso is a former acting undersecretary of the Air Force, former assistant secretary of the Air Force for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, he is also a co-founder of a product design and engineering startup after having served as an executive vice president at one of America's largest and leading financial services company. Throughout his career in the private sector, he has held executive leadership roles in retail, investment banking, insurance, and the ener energy industry. He has also led global teams across functional areas to include technology, digital design, cybersecurity, corporate development, sales, human resources, and many, many other things. I might mention that he is also a U.S. Army veteran, serving in new, numerous staff and leadership positions in support of worldwide operational activities for joint special operations. So welcome, sir, to, to the panel. Uh, and with that, let's get started, please. General Donahue, with, you wouldn't start with your opening comments, please. I can't see the green light here because I'm being blinded by these lights. It's working. It's working. It does. So, sir, thanks so much for that introduction. I have fond memories of, of our service together almost a decade ago when we were uh, when you were the 13th uh, ESC commander uh, at then Fort Hood and now Fort Cavazos. And thank you to AUSA as well for for allowing me to uh, to uh, participate here this morning. So you heard that CASCOM and the Sustainment Center of Excellence work every day to deliver effective sustainment solutions to ensure we'll win on the future battlefield. Solutions to what, you might ask. In conjunction with many teammates, we work closely to identify sustainment gaps, develop concepts, conduct experimentation, and then transform our sustainment capabilities to keep pace with maneuver force modernization. The Army's MDO challenges, specifically sustainment gaps, are a current threat to the Army's ability to open and set theaters at the speed of relevance. We have to think differently about how we generate, ready, about how we generate readiness and sustain large-scale combat operations tomorrow, next year, and over the next decade. As the sustainment force modernization proponent, it is my job to develop and integrate solutions for sustainment doctrine, organizations, material, training, leader development, and personnel, all while influencing facilities and policies to set conditions for Army transformation. While each of these categories involves its own processes, developments in each category have a ripple effect across the spectrum. Frankly, this is where I spend 70% of my time ensuring sustainment and the Army are postured to win. 
We don't do this in isolation, and we're tied at the hip with Army Futures Command, Army Material Command, the Army G4, CAC, and all of our TRADOC COE commanders. While we develop solutions that will sustain future combat formations, we also train and educate soldiers, thousands of soldiers, to fight and win. Each year, nearly a third of the military and civilian personnel who attend TRADOC courses are taught by a CASCOM instructor on Fort Greg Adams, Fort Jackson, Fort Moore, Fort Sill, Fort Eisenhower, Eglin Air Force Base, and across our, our reserve component, One Army School Systems. Fortunately, I inherited and now command an all-star team of leaders, educators, developers, trainers, and analysts who understand not only those processes within their own lane, but also work with partners across the spectrum to, to, to provide the Army with synchronized solutions. With a slew of capability gaps to address, my team and I have a full plate, but we're not tackling these challenges in a vacuum. We work on a daily basis to not only identify and prioritize issues, but also to build and resource effective solutions. I'd like to spend a few minutes to talk about one of those gaps and the journey that we've been on to field predictive logistics capabilities, improving the sensor to shooter to sustainer loop, and getting this cornerstone technology into the hands of our soldiers. As defined in our soon-to-be-updated and released FM40, Predictive Logistics is a system of sensors, communications, and data support tools and data visualization applications that will enable faster and more accurate sustainment decision-making. Predictive Logistics enables decision dominance, greater precision, and speed with running estimates and course of action development providing options for our commanders. Our work has evolved from what started as CBM Plus to PPMX to now what we describe as, predict as predictive logistics. We are leveraging the CBM Plus work and the substantial progress that is already taking place across multiple PEOs with, with the digitization of our maintenance processes to improving onboard diagnostic consumption on individual platforms such as the Abrams and the Paladin improving supply point data consumption, and ultimately improving our strategic ability to manage our combat and tactical wheel vehicle fleets. In early February, our predictive logistics ACDD was approved by General Rainey at the AROC with emphasis and priority on the Abrams and Paladin platforms. We are working closely with PEO C3T, the OPR for PL, and Colonel Shane Upton and the contested logistics CFT for this implementation. Last year, our TRADOC Proponency Office for Sustainment Mission Command, led by Colonel Matt Western, started to facilitate quarterly PL summits, where stakeholders from around the Army and the Enterprise gathered to synchronize and operationalize our PL efforts. Our next PL summit is scheduled for later this week here at Redstone Arsenal and will be facilitated by the CLCFT with participation from across the enterprise as we are now laser focused on transitioning from an ACDD to a CDD. Additionally, we are ensuring that PL is fully integrated into both our enterprise business system convergence efforts and network modernization efforts such as C2 Fix and C2 Next. We've also made significant progress with PEO C3T and our PM for Mission Command, Colonel Matt Paul, to develop sustainment applications within the common operating environment and specifically the command post computing environment. Following the divestment of BCS3 almost eight years ago, our Army senior leaders directed that sustainment move its mission command equities into the common operating environment versus developing a separate standalone system. Through the leadership of then Major General Fogg and Major General Simmerly, now Lieutenant General Simmerly, and Colonel Justin Herberman, who is now our sustainment seated director, CASCOM developed multiple operational need statements to include the automated log stat, sustainment running estimate, asset visibility, and in-transit visibility capabilities. These four ONs were approved by the Mission Command Configuration Steering Board. Software development of the automated log stat began in October 22 and is being conducted by the U.S. Army Weapon and Software Engineering Sec Center up at Picatinny Arsenal. The, the development of the sustainment running estimate also started in October of 22 and is being led by the U.S. Army Engineering Research and Development Center, Center URDIC, up at Fort Belvoir. Last month, we, conduct, we conducted testing with the 1st CAV Division and received valuable feedback on the min viable solutions for both the automated log stat and the sustainment running estimate. 
The AV and ITV capabilities will be developed and tested next year. CASCOM has also been working closely with PEOC 3T, the Network CFT, Mission Command COE, and other stakeholders on the C2FIX network modernization effort with regards to sustainment. We participated in the C2FIX TTX at Fort Leavenworth and will be at Fort Campbell next month during the operational assessment. Finally, I can't leave out our invaluable partnerships with AFC Software Factory and their Artificial Intelligence Center. We have multiple AI ML projects ongoing, such as Projects Mercury, Griffin, and Pangea, that will improve our sustainment running estimates and our logistics common operating picture at Echelon. Near term, PL will have a significant impact on our ASCCs, our cores, our divisions, our brigade combat teams by 2030. Although better, although better visibility, predictability, and velocity will enhance the entire sustainment enterprise's ability to support the warfighter, it is really setting conditions for precision sustainment by 2040. PL isn't a sustainment capability. It's a warfighting capability that builds combat readiness. At the Sustainment Center of Excellence, we don't have the monopoly on great ideas. Instead, we are counting on your input and your feedback to help us develop those sustainment capabilities necessary to support our warfighting formations. That's why conversations like this one and throughout this week are so important. Last month, Major General Smith commented at the AUSA Hot Topics panel and I quote, we the Army cannot resolve our problems without our partners and stakeholders in industry, government, and academia. The risks are high and success depends on collaboration, communication, and cooperation, end quote. I open with the depth and breadth of our MDO challenges, but the solutions that are being developed across all our various partners are truly cutting edge and being developed at the speed of relevance. Thank you to all of you, and thank you to your teams of teams. And I look forward to your questions this morning and throughout the rest of this week. Chris, over to you. Great. Thank you. Colonel Upton, please. Oh, Comments sorry. from you. I don't have the green light, but I, I can hear myself, so I think we're good. First of all, sir, thank you, um, one, for inviting me to be on the panel. And really thanks to AUSA. These events are great because it is truly, like General Donahue said, a partnership between our, our national industrial base, our organic industrial base, our military partners, and, and industry as a whole. So I wanna expound a little bit on what General Donahue said. Um, it, first of all, this panel member, we truly all are a team and have been a team. I, I was working with Chris Hill um, two, two and a half years ago, sitting in another job. So it's, it's good to be up here with familiar faces, but it's also good to see some really familiar faces in the audience. So why the CFT? I think General Donahue hit the nail on the head. We have to develop solutions at the speed of relevance. And quite frankly, our adversaries are not on our timeline. And I think that's an obvious statement, but I think it needs to be stated here in this group because this is the team that's gonna solve this problems, as I said before, our industry partners and, and those here in uniform and, and, and in our civilian workforce. So our portfolio, and General LeMaster mentioned it, PL, Precision Sustainment, it is an army. So when you think the past language of core army modernization efforts, PL is now one of those for our secretary and our chief. And I'm glad to be partnered uh, with, was General Simmerly, now Lieutenant General Simmerly, and now Major General Donahue on that effort moving forward. Because it is an absolute priority to bring readiness to our combat formations and make decisions at the speed of relevance. Because quite frankly, precision is a must. Because in the largest sports theater, where you look at combat forces that may be dispersed of thousands of miles, say Indo-PACOM, you're going to have to be precise with where we put those assets. And we'll need to be able to see that ahead of time as we project power. In a contested environment, like General Mohan opened up with, that's going to be contested from our homeland to the foxhole, or in reverse from the foxhole back to that factory. What are we doing and what do we need industries help with in that place? First of all, PPMX, CBM Plus, the, the look at material health and maintenance of our systems, critically important. But I would say also critically important is looking from end to end, foxhole to factory to our ammunition. When we consume it, and then giving that signature to industry and our organic industrial base when they need to resupply it. Also, fuel. Things we're thinking about. These censored items in the past, we have not censored those. Little, little reflection on my own career. We were still 
putting wood sticks and fuel tankers just a couple years ago in Europe. We need your help. You know, for, for a lot of our history, the defense industrial base, along with our partners, was an innovative leader. It's really now corporations are leading innovation, and we have to be your partner. Developing sensors to look at fuel consumption, ammo consumption at platform, all the way back to the, the strategic edge, they have to be low cost. You know, I, I'm men viable product. The exquisite solution is good, but I will tell you, as needing to develop this at the speed of relevance, we need products that will get to that ability to see ourselves better. You know, General Donahue and I talked about an example in fuel just a few months ago, and it was really General Simile and I started this topic. I just came from the National Training Center. We just executed what we call Project Convergence Capstone 4, which is one of our premier series of experiments and a persistent experimentation outcome that the Army has developed over the last few years to develop and test with our industry partners these emerging technologies. And fuel came to the forefront. And I hearkened again back to probably some sins of Upton's past of how much fuel we would backhaul in a rotation just at the National Training Center supporting a brigade combat team. It's, it's eye-opening. We will not be able to afford that when it's contested and we need to be able to disperse those forces just as a vignette. So we need your help. You know, that's why I kind of put this, I know this, this audience is full of our industry partners. We've got to look how to censor that quickly, how to do it quite frankly inexpensively. I think that technology I know is out there in those, and then that data feeds back. Ammo is another piece of that. We, 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 maintain effects right now on the battlefield with some pretty exquisite munitions. But we're also looking, as General Mohan meant, if we can drop something that's low cost from a drone, you've got to resupply that. And we've got to be able to show you that signature as we consume it, because quite frankly, we're going to need that at time of need and ahead of time of need. Some other things we're looking at in the CFT, human machine integration. Now, General Rainey will talk later this week about it in depth as we go forward in some of these concepts. But here's a paraphrase. Offsetting risk to machines to enable humans to do what humans do best. What do I mean by that? That's a pretty nebulous statement. Humans will make ethical decisions. I think it's a pretty common opinion, or maybe just my opinion, that would we'll probably not get to where machines have cognitive ethic a decision-making ability. But we need the humans to do that. But there are tasks, absolutely, in the sustainment warfighting function as we build readiness and deliver readiness that can be offloaded on machines. I'll talk about just a few of them and kind of as, as, a, as a, a collaborative environment with our, with our partners in industry and, and our other partners in this. Fueling. A lot of times we will refuel critical combat platforms very far forward on the battlefield. It's a high-risk operation. We're looking for the technology solutions. General Donahue and again, Dr. Hill's team and AMC, it's an enterprise approach to figure out how we do some of those tasks with the human there, but also offsetting some of that risk with a machine. Robotic refueling. Looking at how we rearm combat platforms with robots or that technology. When you talk human machine integration, think a concept of multi-domain resupply. So you put an autonomous watercraft on the water you fly a drone. We did this at Capstone 4. It was a lot of great effort led by Justin Herberman's team in the sustainment seated and our CASCON teammates. And for the first time, the Army and the Marine Corps went out over the beach, out over to the water, and used resupply of critical repair parts, small amounts of ammunition, and even 3D printed parts from added manufacturing and flew them with drones onto the shore. So what? The so what is, drones are really good over land, but we had not really seen when, you're, when your terrain you're navigating over is just all blue. That's a pretty significant thing. And I, when I look at the industry partners in the room, we have to not only maintain that momentum and that technology, but for logistics, there are tiered approaches, as we always have. And that's something I don't think is going to morph away. At the forward tactical edge, Absolutely. Smaller resupply runs, smaller resupply pounds and cube. But as you move closer back to that joint security area, we are going to need capabilities of some of these unmanned platforms to quite frankly have greater range, have a greater payload capability, and be able to loiter and turn as we need to redirect that critical sustainment at point of need. It ties back to that precision piece. The third thing, advanced power solutions. We, 
And all this as I talk about it, advanced power and the last one that General LeMaster's mentioned, the demand reduction, those are interwoven. Really, when you talk a contested environment for logistics, we have got to bring to the point where we reduce the demand on our distribution systems because if they are truly contested, we are only going to get windows potentially opened up by our maneuver and combat enabling forces that will be able to move those critical supplies. We experimented that in a joint fashion at Camp Pendleton, California during con convergence with the United States Marine Corps and Navy. Using simulated joint, joint effects and fires, opening up what they call a multi-domain corridor to move those sustainment assets in. Well, if we can reduce the amount of fuel burn by hybrid technology, advanced power technologies like hydrogen fuel cells, those technologies a lot of you are working on, then you reduce that point of need at tactical edge demand and the resupply then can, quite frankly, occur either less frequently or the combat formation forward can go in a longer combat in an operational endurance before we would need to resupply. Also think hybrid technology of drive systems. If the physical combat platform's consuming less of certain things, same concept. And then demand reduction. But I wanna pull just a simple thread on that. Point of need production of commodities. Now, as General Rainey, my, my boss from Futures Command, told me, and I had these discussions with General Simmerly and General Donahue, what focus? Well, it's really a fundamental focus I've, we've all, as logisticians, been focused on for most of our careers. Ammo, fuel, medical, and maintenance, or as the term goes, and I hate to it bore with acronyms, 3-5 Mike Mike. The ammo and fuel I talked about, the medical is imperative as well. We, we are fully nested with the medical she did, and Colonel James Jones and his team, on how we'll also look at critical class eight and bring that to bear on the battlefield, moving blood, plasma, and those critical class eight AIMs. And then the maintenance piece of it. But reducing those demands, we need to partner with you all, the team here from our defense industrial base and our, our partners, and across the DOD on how we produce items, think repair parts. Quite frankly, think low cost munitions at point of need. And we've seen a lot of lessons observed from the current conflicts in the Ukraine, quite frankly, lessons observed from, from Gaza, on how some of that technology is in, in morphing itself on a very rapid, very lethal battlefield. Hopefully that's helpful. I, I really, again, appreciate being on this panel and, and being able to speak to you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Colonel Upton. I appreciate that. Dr. Hill, please. Thank you, General LeMaster. I appreciate the invitation uh, by you and AUSA to be on this panel. And I can tell you it's, it would be impossible to overstate the honor I feel being uh, associated with this group of fine leaders from the sustainment and technology enterprise. Uh, Yogi Berra once said, the future ain't what it used to be. And I can't think of a better quote that, that better represents the data and analytics space. Uh, in our space, uh, it is characterized by constant change. We get change on the way data streams. Uh, we find new challenges with what we call non-standard data every day. Technology develops at a rate so fast in this space that it seems like it's just a constant evolution. And on top of that, uh, we have to evolve algorithms uh, to keep up with that, and uh, most notably the artificial intelligence advancements. So it's a very challenging place to, uh, to live and work. Uh, that said, I can tell you today, the sustainment enterprise is well on its way to becoming the data-centric uh, part of the Army that the Secretary has envisioned for us, and that we in the sustainment enterprise are executing uh, predictive and precision sustainment operations with data and analytics today. We've been doing advanced analytics in the sustainment enterprise for a really long time, uh, even including artificial intelligence. Um, but what I would tell you is uh, we've, we've done pretty well at operationalizing it, but we're, we're well short of our objective. Uh, that really became obvious to us two years ago when we were asked to support the operations in Europe, and we realized what a difference the speed and scale, the volume and the dynamics of large-scale combat operations has on the sustainment enterprise and the resulting data and analytics. So it's been for us almost like building an airplane while in flight, figuring out how to adjust our approach to this uh, while operations were going on. 
And the benefit of that has been it's forced us to do a lot of learning very quickly, and it's allowed us to, uh, to do a lot of innovation. Uh, so what I thought I would do is share a few examples of some of the use cases that we've, uh, that we've applied over in Europe to give you some example of where we are today in the data and analytics space. Uh, so first of all, we've leveraged forecasting techniques and algorithms to forecast repair parts and ammunition well out into the future. Uh, we have augmented this with simulation capabilities that allow us to put some degree of uncertainty on deliveries. Uh, this is a very complex coalition in Europe, and so uh, deliveries are coming from all corners of the globe, and so we have to be able to look far enough out that we can influence uh, the, the read on whether or not logistics will become a constraining factor to desired operations. We've built simulations that represent the integration of force structure and the development of new units uh, so we could tell if uh, the Ukrainian objectives were going to be met on time or when problems would occur before they occurred. And then we've morphed that into a dynamic task organization type tool that allows them to not only make changes uh, to task organization, but for us to see what the effects of those changes are in terms of requirements for commodities and supply, and also uh, in terms of our forecast for where they will be in the future. Uh, we've specifically spent a lot of time uh, forecasting readiness, uh, not just of systems, uh, but of units. And as units are conducting combat operations, uh, we can see that in forecast um, their capabilities as they go through time. We have mapped the transportation network uh, from as far as this reaches in the joint uh, strategic support area all the way through the transportation network to the point of delivery to the Ukrainians. And th this has enabled a lot of things, but not the least of which is we can see where things are in that network, in the supply chain, and forecast when things uh, will, should show up on the other end. These impacts have been pretty substantial for us. Uh, so first of all, what it's allowed the logis logistics leaders to do is change their plan of support when we, when we forecast that something's not going to be there when the operator needs it. It also enables that commander to make decisions. So if, if we have a mode of transportation that's not going to deliver something we need in time, he can affect the change in mode of transportation before that becomes a problem. One of our biggest uh, advantages is we've been able to work through the typical challenges of adoption uh, as the Security Assistance Group Ukraine headquarters has adopted these advanced technologies. And I can tell you, uh, culture is always a problem, and uh, what we learned in this uh, particular use case is the perfect antidote for culture is the commander. When the commander embraces this technology and these advanced analytics and starts demanding them in his daily battle <coughs> update briefs, then the staff comes along for the ride. And when you, you know you've really turned the corner when the staff starts asking you to develop specific capabilities for them. And uh, we, we certainly got there pretty fast uh, in Europe. We have enabled all this with a system we call the AMC Predictive Analysis Suite, or APAS. What APAS does for us is it gives us a platform in which we can integrate the data and uh, analytic tools. It gives us a thread from the tactical to the strategic level. So while all three of those levels have different uses for the data, it shares common data. So at the tactical level, uh, we can see when a specific system is forecast to go down, uh, where parts that would uh, enable it to meet its operational readiness requirements, where they are in supply chain, when it will come up. At the operational level, it's enabled us to have a partnership with the theater sustainment commands to make sure that our stockage is right uh, well forward and allows us to, to, again, consider the entire coalition. So it's been a huge challenge for us, this coalition. You know, there's a lot of uh, historical partners there, but there's some new ones too. And bringing all that data to bear and integrating it in the analytics space has, has certainly been a challenge. At the strategic level, we use that information to make forecasts at the national level to set our supply chain. And as many of you know, sometimes that takes 18 to 24 months uh, to cycle. So it lets us get well ahead of problem, uh, problems and it allows us to optimize our supply chain. I would, I would say our, uh, we've had some setbacks along the way, but I would classify our work there as a huge success. I think part of our keys to success lie in the fact that we took a strategy based on use cases. So commander had a specific problem, 
we use data and analytics to solve that problem. But the real secret sauce to our success is our workforce, uh, our, our great soldiers and, and our resilient civilians who have moved forward to support this. Uh, their skills are unmatched. Um, their, their ingenuity and ability to innovate uh, is quite impressive. And when you can take a functional logistician who's an expert in the data and pair them with a data scientist or an operations research analyst who understands the analytics side, uh, you definitely have the recipe for success. We could not have achieved this success without a, a strong partnership with industry. And I can tell you going in that we, we could not do this alone. Uh, generally, we rely on industry for three things. Uh, when, when we don't have the capacity and we need to augment our workforce, uh, when we don't have specific capabilities, and then when we need to innovate, a lot of the, ref the innovation that we have applied there has come straight from our industry partners. And we've learned a lot in our support. Um, first of all, we have a very uh, distributed and federated approach, which allows us to push analytics to the edge and bring multiple vendors uh, into the solution space. We've had a very good hybrid support model where we have organic assets and industry partners developing side by side. And we've even le leveraged industry for training of our organic workforce on use cases. So when there's a specific problem, a contractor can help teach uh, an organic analyst and then we can move forward together. This has all been enabled by a very decentralized governance in our APAS system, uh, again, to push analytics at the edge. So where do we need your help? Uh, well, industry, we always need your help on the innovation side. There's no question about that. But the one category I would say we need more help in right now than anywhere else is the uh, advancement of artificial intelligence and specifically generative artificial intelligence. Uh, we're doing our best to balance those risks and understand the policy implications that are coming out from the Department of Defense and the Army. Um, and industry is, is key to helping us uh, negotiate that and still have the trust in those applications when we field them. Uh, so I, I thank the group, the industry as a group, for your partnership. Uh, we could not have done it without you. Uh, I appreciate your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Dr. Hill. Appreciate it. To our final panelist, Mr. <laughs> Manasco, over to you for your comments, please. Well, I, I promise I will keep it, uh, I'll keep it brief here, but I would like just to share a few thoughts. The, the first is Dr. Hill and I and our teams have spent a lot of time together over the last couple of years. And so as Michelle, you were talking and Shane, I wrote down a quote from my favorite philosopher, Yogi Berra, <laughs> uh, which was the future isn't what it used to be, right? So um, we have that in common. Um, a, a few things that I would just uh, highlight, I think we all are in agreement that in this world of constrained and contested logistics and supply chains, that precision sustainment is going to be a real key, right, to deter and if we have to, uh, to fight and win our nation's wars. The, the conflict in, in Europe today for, for us as a, as a partner to, to AMC and to what's happening at SAGU has been really interesting uh, to watch. So for those of you that have been in that environment, uh, it's really powerful for at the nightly brief for you to see with live data the fusion of intel, operations, and sustainment. Um, there's not a PowerPoint slide to be found, and I agree with, with Chris, the anecdote to a culture that might be a little staid is, is the commander. And so I give uh, the SAGU commander, both uh, present and past, right, the, uh, the highest of accolades for ensuring that the teams on the ground are doing what they can to actually use live information. So, uh, and we're part, proud to be a part of that effort. I would also say that um, if we're to realize our C, JAD, C2 uh, vision, then what we really need to be able to do is to be able to integrate in sus our sustainment enterprise and think about it holistically across not only the U.S. and the joint force, but also with coalition partners. And that's been one of those complexities that we've had to work through uh, in Europe, and it's something that we are definitely learning uh, quickly, and uh, we're anxious to be able to support uh, and export those learnings across uh, wherever conflict uh, arises. But it's true that software uh, can knit all of this together, and that's where I think we as industry 
owe the United States Army and the Joint Force our very best in collective uh, thinking in terms of how do you do that and do that well. Because the technology exists today, not five years, ten years in the future, for you to get a sensor uh, off of a munition that was expended from a gun tube, for that to flow through the warfighter, the echelons of the chains of command, to the TSC, to inventories that are managed uh, in the CONUS, and all the way back to the manufacturing uh, organizations, whether that be manufacturing that we do here in the United States Army uh, or uh, in our arsenals or even in industry. And it actually extends beyond that because industry can leverage these same set of tools to actually see themselves clearly and see their supply chain so that you can look at this really uh, from an end-to-end -end perspective. And when we can get to that place, then I think uh, we're going to be uh, in a much better place. Um, the emphasis that I, that I would place on that, though, is it, it really is a capability that uh, exists today. And so there's real progress being made across the joint uh, force. And as I look uh, across and have experiences and, and seeing what uh, other services are doing, it's those services that are actually leveraging the highly skilled uh, personnel that they have to develop capabilities on really strong platforms that are highly configurable and highly extensible. All too often we, we develop point solutions that don't scale, and I think that's where we as an industry, a set of industry partners, can and should be doing more to support um, that effort. We're obviously committed uh, to working alongside uh, Dr. Hill uh, and Drill Mohan and the AMC team, and just as they were there from the beginning of the conflict in Europe, uh, so was Palantir. And so we're very proud of that work and look forward to that continuing. But the bold vision that, that what we have for this um, needs to be resourced. Um, and if it can be resourced, then I think we can make really extraordinary progress. And I'll leave you with this. Um, as I reflect on this idea that the capability does exist now, um, half of our business is not just serving the Department of Defense and other governments uh, around the Western world, but half of it is in the commercial space. And in the commercial context, um, I would offer that there is inspiration to be found. Um, one particular long-standing customer of ours, Airbus, does this and does this exceedingly well. Um, and so, as an example, they had an issue with their A350 delivery times. Um, we were able to help them uh, really see their supply chains clearly, understand where their bottlenecks were, and the results were really powerful. They increased production by 33%. They drove $850 million more in revenue. They avoided $1.7 billion in cost. Uh, and what I think is really interesting is they have 25,000 users on these platforms, and they're developing new capabilities. Um, they don't need us to do that through no-code and low-code capabilities, um, they're making really great strides. And so as we step back and think about the future, um, I just would say if we can leverage those experiences in the commercial sector, we'll be better off, and it'll allow us to get to where we want to get much faster than we otherwise would be. Great. Thank you, sir. Great comments. So now we're very fortunate. We've got about 40 minutes for questions and answers. And I've already got a bunch lined up here on the desk that are pouring in. Uh, they may be specifically addressed uh, to the, a certain panel member. Of course, the panel, everybody on the panel have opportunity to make a comment because most of them are relative across the board. Uh, we'll also have an opportunity that, to discuss it. So if someone in the audience, there's a point that comes out on that question, you know, please stand, get recognized. You might have to come forward so we can hear you. If there's additional point, we need to clarify on a specific question. So I'll start uh, with one question from the audience, uh, and this is really directed to the entire panel, uh, and it, it deals specifically with contested logistics and the thoughts that the panel has about resupply using recycled parts, locally sourced uh, feed stock, scrap, construction materials, cardboard, et cetera. Uh, and he makes a comment specifically that there's been a lot of lessons learned here from Ukraine. So the, the way I'd like to shape it, if we could, please, is, 
give General Donahue and Colonel Upton, you know, an opportunity maybe to talk about some thought work that's going on in that area, and then maybe uh, uh, Dr. Hill, you and, and Mr. Manasco, you could talk a little bit about some realities that we may have seen uh, out of the assistance group for Ukraine, because they reference Ukraine here. So please, uh, General Donahue, any thoughts on that question? So we've got a ton of effort right now and partnerships. Um, I'll, I'll hit on a couple. Um, uh, we like to innovate with DARPA uh, because they're really kind of 15, 20 years ahead from a technology perspective. They got great partnerships with, with academia as well. Um, and so right now we've got a couple of efforts from a demand reduction perspective. Um, for both water and fuel, um, as well as food. Um, and so you talked about uh, using um, uh, things at the point of need. Uh, and so right now they've got a project called Project Cornucopia that from a food perspective, our supply chain for food is, is, is rather large. So is our water uh, supply chain. Actually, water is probably our greatest uh, supply chain um, when it comes to uh, requirements for trucks um, on the battlefield. And so, so Project Corticopia is looking specifically at how they use natural organisms in the environment. Um, I'm sure our soldiers will be really ecstatic to be able to uh, drink like a protein locally produced um, shake, so to speak. Um, but at the end of the day, we're trying to get after using organic uh, substances. The same with Erdic. Erdic right now is working a lot of things from an engineering perspective. Um, uh, concrete, right? We don't want to move concrete um, uh, and, the, and all of the things that it takes to build and repair runways um, and so they're looking at also um, products out there uh, that can get after that um, so those are just a couple of things I can't Great. speak Colonel Upton yeah Shane over yes ma'am so just kind of to off of Sean's point so predictive logistics kind of the in state that we see this and we've talked about this I talked with Dr. Hill I talked with General Donahue is prescriptive and when you talk about that perspective specific question prescriptive is I'm gonna harken you back to what we do now so go to Europe we have line haul vehicles that are commercially they're commercial vehicles um, and when we have a repair parts thing we look across our enterprise to include civilian sources based on the question maybe even locally sourced at a dealership depending on the piece of equipment you fast forward that into technology that's already here and what we're looking at and partnering thinking about is in a PL tool as we write that capabilities development document, not only be able to see our DOD, our DLA partner stocks, but see stocks worldwide of partners in theater. I'll pull a couple threads. Um, Ukraine lessons observed rapidly, but I think they apply globally. If you deployed forces into the Pacific, you may need repair parts and equipment that come from a, a distributor that's in Guam or the Philippines or somewhere in that area. You go to Europe, same thing. These are, these are first world large economies and being able to see that. So what's the so what? The thinking we're thinking is in a, in a predictive logistics tool, a capability, you offer that warfighting commander the ability for his logisticians or her logisticians to also see those industry partners' source of supply or their supply chain. And Sean made a very good point and kind of pulled that thread. That's an end-to-end DOD-wise, but then you, you expand that into the defense industrial base. And I think that's one of the things we're looking at that, and that's absolutely off a lesson observed from the Ukraine. Sometimes it's quite faster in that point of need. Sometimes the point of need resupply is something that's already there, but it's just in the commercial market. So we've got to look at that. And I call it prescriptive because that tool, these suites of technology, and, and, and Dr. Hill's team has done it with the SAG-U, give you a prescriptive matter of the second and third order effects of what making that decision will do to you in time and then in providing that operational endurance to those commanders so they can continue their operations. But just some thoughts that were kind of in that thought space um, for that question, hopefully. That Dr. Hill, Mr. Manasco, any comments about SAG-U and some great examples of this being applied? In general, I would say, you know, what, 
What struck me as I started working on this was the nature of what contested logistics means. Uh, because you have kind of in your mind somebody's attacking your stockpile of some sort of commodity that you, that you have. But when you think about a theater, the entire theater is not at war. Um, so you have to move things through that theater to get it to the point of need. And to, to General Brown's point this morning about reform of institutions, many of those institutions are the ones that are slowing you down. So it's the challenge of the logistician and their supporting analysts to try to figure out, hey, what's a demand signal? How many do I need to have there without having too many that adds a different kind of risk? And I think where some of these locally sourced uh, stocks really help us is when we get that wrong. Um, because the penalty from, from time, you know, if you're getting that repair part in Guam, you know, it's not showing up overnight, particularly if it's on a ship. Uh, so that's where I think in, in the Ukrainians' approach to things with some of the local work they've done has really um, allowed them to mitigate unforeseen challenges and, and do it in a much quicker way. Mr. Manasco, any thoughts? The, the, the only other thing that I might add, this is another place where I think we can and should seek inspiration from the private sector because, uh, as an example, when the war kicked off uh, in the Ukraine, um, there were companies that were able to see themselves in their supply chains pretty clear, clearly, um, and they were able to reroute right, their supply chains because they knew that they had parts flowing into those regions. And it's that work that they did up front um, that allowed them in the crisis to actually perform or outperform their competitors. And I would argue, I think that's a great opportunity, you know, for us. And as been has been mentioned, the the situation in Europe is vastly different than that in the Pacific, for obvious reasons. And so I think we have to get even. Um, we probably have to do more work in the Pacific, candidly, than we would um, have to in Europe, since just the proximity is such so much better as the panel discussed several of them talked about challenges to industry so i've got two similarly related questions about bringing capabilities to the government the first one dr hill to you is you know how do we bring uh analytic capabilities uh, uh, tools and things that we have that may be working uh, for our industry or other services to you so that the government can take a look at it so first of all, uh, forums like this are, are act absolutely key uh, to our collective success. Uh, so because of all that dynamic change in this side of the, the world I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we have to know what industry is doing. And when, when you have an innovation in this space, we, we, you have to get to us to tell us what that is. Um, I think we've done a good job of implementing our systems with open architectures and having that federated approach I mentioned earlier where we can bring multiple uh, vendors in. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of complexities in doing that in terms of how you set your contract up, what the organic side can do, what the contractors can do. But all that's workable. So I think uh, the, the first key I would say is it's our communication to make sure we understand what it is you're doing. And the second is it's on us to set up a system and architecture that enables that kind of collaboration. This one. Uh, Colonel Upton really is, is specifically geared to you, but it, it deals with any material solution inside your portfolio, and it's basically the same type of question. You know, what are the opportunities that are upcoming, or how do we bring technology uh, to the CFT to take a look at how it may support your objectives and goals? No, that's a great question. So I, I want to pull something that's really developed in the last year, or less than a year, with the Chief, General George, General Rainey, and then also... Uh, the CASCOM, CG, and the Sustainable <clears throat> Center of Excellence. And what it is is these three time horizons. And I want to talk about them really quickly to answer the question because the way we're looking at transformation is really in three time horizons. I'll, but I'll go to the middle one first. The Army's been focused and really have been pretty successful in the last five to ten years on focusing on the goal of 2030 and, and delivering some signature modernization efforts in that time band. Um, and that's major weapons platforms. Some of them are already out there. And sure read some of the other things that you, you, you all are very familiar. Some of you may have worked at. Um, there's a focus also on what we can bring to 2040. But the new kind of thinking that came very recently is this concept of transforming and contact. And that's the one I want to pull on on that question. In this 18 to 24 month space, one, like Dr. Hill said, 
have the conversations with us now. Tell us what you're working on. So first, we see if it aligns with what the, where the Army's going. Um, so now Upton, answer where the Army's going. We're going towards stuff that is men viable product. And we'll set that as kind of that threshold. You come, you talk to us about it. And there's, there's inputs to that. You sponsor. I'll tell you, a great means is partner with a lab. Partner with a DevCom or a partner that's an Army lab, and you partner, then it's common goal. But we're taking the innovation ability that a lot of you hold, some of the capabilities of the, in the DoD that those labs hold, and it's a partnership. General Donahue and the team selectively, the CDA, the CFT now, are sponsoring newer emerging technologies. That sponsorship is just to get that conversation started, and it finally, it emanates from conversations like this, panels like this, AUSAs, other forums where we have that professional dialogue. But that's looking at that quicker time frame to get stuff into soldiers' hands. General Mohan mentioned it up front, General Rainey will talk about it, so I won't steal his thunder, but I will say we want to put those technologies that are already there into the hands of soldiers. It's a great example of what AMC's done in, in Europe and what, what our collective um, industry partners have done in Europe. But Doc Hill hit it. You put it in the hand of a staff soldier or commander and have them work on it and, and learn from it, you, that's how you get, I think, into that conversation. Hopefully that helps, and I'll turn it over to him. So, sir, just to put on that too, so we've got a couple of opportunities here um, over the next couple months. One, we've got a great partnership with AUSA uh, later this fall before the big uh, October convention uh, where we'll hold an industry uh, week at uh, Fort Greg Adams. And so there's a great opportunity to come participate, show us what you're working on, challenge us. Uh, to explain to you what we're looking at. Uh, in addition to that, we love um, when you bring us technology and we can integrate that into our own experimentation efforts. So we've got experimentation efforts that are, that are, that are hosted by the Futures and Concepts Center inside of AFC, uh, but we also have, and just as Shane mentioned, the Chief is really hitting on this transformation in, in, in contact. And so we've got brigades uh, right now in uh, 25th ID, 101st, um, um, 10th Mountain right now that are experimenting with uh, with various sustainment technology. Now, in some cases, some of that is uh, Army uh, program of record, kind of an ACDD approach. We already have experimentation dollars out there to get after that. But also, in some cases, that is that is industry sponsored and funded in some cases your own investment dollars uh, to come show us what you have. So we are all in on one again, just like Shane said partnering with Erdic, DevCom, any of the Futures Commands labs, there, you know, we don't, have an, we don't have a monopoly on great ideas, like I said before. So, so, so come be a partner with us, um, and, and, and the best feedback you'll get is when that, that young non-commissioned officer uh, tells you how you can make your product better, and then informs us about, about what we need to do to, to craft our requirements documents better for you. Great. Mr. Manasco, I'll put you on the spot. We, we had an interesting discussion during one of our prep sessions. You know, and as the government has challenged industry, you made a couple of comments to us about, you know, some cautions to government to get away from old think that makes it easier for contractors and industry to bring in ideas. I don't know, I know I'm putting you on your spot. If you remember those comments, if you mind sharing that, you know, to our government ears that are off. Did what I say, was it palatable or was it? <laughs> it was great. Too, no, too it, was spicy. Spot, it was spot on. I thought it was um, right on the money. Uh, so, so look, the, one of the things I have the benefit of, of doing is um, I, I used to spend a lot of time in the Pentagon. And, and so I, I saw, and by the way, it's great to be with my Army team, uh, even though I did spend a couple of years in the Air Force. Um, they're great too. But I, I saw uh, the team spend a, a lot of money on uh, someone who was, was a really good salesperson, they had a really good PowerPoint presentation, <clears throat> and convinced uh, you know, the, the services that they could actually do something in the future. <clears throat> and, and I saw too, all too often, I saw them not be successful and they spend a lot of money. And, and resourcing right now, when like flat is the new up from a budgetary standpoint, I think those are just risks that we collectively can't afford to, to take. Um, and so uh, I, I do think that it's important for 
uh, and I mentioned this earlier, it's important, I think, for our, 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 our teams to be able to uh, develop on top of an infrastructure and platforms that you know are scalable. And, you, and we have to do that today and that are proven. And I think that's the piece where um, if we can get oriented around that, I think you can fully leverage uh, all of what industry can bring, and we can fully leverage um, all of what our men and women in uniform or, their, or, or DA civilians can bring. Because what I used to see was frustration who someone was uh, writing code and they were on a platform that just, they, they couldn't fully deploy. It was great, but they couldn't fully deploy it. And it's been said, and this might be, you know, a little spicy for the group, but it's been said that here in the very near future that the predominant coding language in the world is going to be the English language. So what does that mean, right? And how do we take advantage of these new tools that exist, right, to be able to help us move more quickly? Great. Uh, General Donahue, this one's a, a, a little bit broader and it gets into, you know, broader aspects of .mil PF, but uh, the question is, you know, how in this era of diminishing resources do we ensure the capability to generate and project ready combat forces, what we're here to talk about in the panel, um, to generate these forces into, at a modernization pace with operational force, and what potential changes do you see that's critical to enable this ability to sustain warfighting function in the JSSA? Just potentially some thoughts between you, probably, uh, Colonel Upton, you may have some thoughts on that as well. Okay. It's a big one that's like describes it, my whole job. It, it is, explain <laughs> the theory to the universe. <laughs> so I guess what I would offer is, um, is uh, sustainment can't be a growth industry, can't continue to be a growth industry for, for the United States Army. Mm. Under the leadership of General Simmerly, the team took a look at, um, at, at, at what, sort of how we see demand and, and how demand has grown over the last five decades or so. Um, they took current formations, they went back over, again, really since the 1970s, and they basically swapped out all of our plat all of our combat platforms over time, and and w and what we saw was this massive increase in one fuel, almost. And I think I said this in shocks and folks back last month when we were up at uh, up in Arlington at the AUSA Hot, Top Hot Topic panel series, almost a 394 percent growth in fuel. Mm. We've seen from a mechanics perspective from our technicians out there. Um, almost a 37% growth in just how do we, uh, basically our growth of our mechanic force structure because systems are getting much more complicated and they take a lot longer to repair based on the complexity of the systems. So from a DOTML PF perspective, we are absolutely laser focused in on uh, and across all of our various teammates. Um, I don't know if Jeff Norman's out here right now from uh, Next Gen Combat uh, Vehicle CFT, but really work closely with his team along with Shane, and Shane worked really closely with, with his team when it came to PL too, but also just from a hybridization of that vehicle. Uh, every vehicle, and I think Shane hit it when he talked about the Vance Power, has got to roll off the assembly line um, and be a net power producer. Uh, we've got to curb that demand um, curve when it comes to fuel. So what keeps me up at light is, is simply the fact that from a sustainment perspective, we are costing the Army a lot of money because of how our platforms have considered or have just continued to, uh, um, to require much more when it comes to really 3.5 Mike Mike writ large. Maybe not the medical piece, but definitely on the other pieces. So Shane? Just a, a couple thoughts. So I think part of the contested environment, and Doc Hill mentioned it, and, and we see it here in the United States, is just how do you move stuff with freedom of movement? I mean, it's pretty big development you know, when you talk the coalition piece, because this is absolutely a DOD, a joint, and a coalition partner, but establishing the Schengen zone for movement now in Europe and three of our core partners, that's a huge piece of that. I say, and I pull that thread because that's one of the things as we could de develop these dialogues with industry, 
with our, I see our joint and coalition partners out there. I see German officers, I see officers from the UK. These are partners. We will never, I think, go alone into any conflict of the future. It's just not doable as, as nations and allies. That's one piece of it. But to that question of that contested environment, how do we ensure that? We've also got to give options. And we've got a lot of exquisite options, but you'll see a lot of dialogue, and I'm looking forward to that dialogue with industry on the less exquisite options that we can mass. And when you look at something like China, they absolutely are exceeding our magazine depth right now. And you'll hear General Flynn talk about it and the user pack, you know, but how do you offset that? That's a contested piece as well. When our adversary has an overmatch, we have to be precise. We have to be precise where we put things. We're gonna ha we've had some dis big discussions at AMC, the Army, and stuff on how we position things. Those are all discussions we've got to continue to have. And General Donahue made some great points about how we partner with our modernization teammates, but that's back to industry joint coalition because I think it's a cumulative effect. If we get our partners to open up that freedom of maneuver on a land-based domain, win. If you look at AI or tools, machine learning, large, large language models, that we can see that environment from CONUS forward, and have options of how we deploy, and maybe we deploy, you know, and that's also ties back to the human machine integrated piece of this. You know, there's a phrase there that the chief and, and General Rainey now use that we should not shed American blood with, with soldiers in first contact anymore. Logisticians are soldiers. We should be putting some of this as we're contested from homeland forward and using modern technology to move some of that. Maybe they're vessels that you know, have different capabilities. Maybe they're projection of aircraft um, in different means. So just some thoughts about that, but I just kind of put, that's a great question, but it's a big one. <laughs> like General Donahue and I said, that's any, kind of our day jobs. Any other yeah, panel, any thoughts, anything you'd like to add before we move on to the next I piece? might <clears throat> pull the thread on the uh, constrained resources and the resourcing piece of it, because, uh, you know, what you find in the, in the space I operated in, most of the contracts we enter in with industry are service type contracts. And so it's really easy to screw that up from the government side. You, you have to have flexible contracting vehicles that allow you to respond to the way the operations are changing. So, I mean, it's been just astounding as, as they go from, you know, a defensive posture to try to blunt an attack to a, a local counter attack to a large scale offense, what the, what the requirements changes were for us and our industry partners. So you have to be able to adjust that contract. Uh, in a way that doesn't have you paying for something you no longer need because it's not relevant to the battle anymore. And you, you also have to write those requirements broad enough to let industry innovate and let them wow you. And then I would tell you on top of that, you have to have, I mean, this just sounds like standard blocking and tackling, but it's absolutely true. You have to have rigorous program management. You have to see who's using it, where you're spending your money, and stay on top of that almost daily to make sure you can uh, free those resources up to go back to other parts of the fight. Great, thanks. So the fuel comment has hit, got a bunch of questions on fuel mm -hmm. stuff. This one's specifically, Shane, to you, it's a, it's a, it's a material-related one. You talked a little bit about this, and it deals you know, more with generators and reducing demand and less generators on the battlefield. Uh, what is the Army's vision plan to incorporate onboard power into new production combat vehicles versus material developer incorporating, uh, incorporating these post-production? Any thoughts? And I know General Donnie, you, you've got some probably input into that as well. Oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab and then I'll pass it over to my teammate from General Donahue. Um, first of all, mobile, think secure, tactical, advanced mobile power. And, and that's a concept, but it's also things we've exercised in convergence. And what is that? That's reducing generators on the battlefield because the vehicle system, combat platform, resupply platform, has onboard power generative capability. And as we move our formations, because it absolutely plays with lessons learned in the Ukraine, lessons we're seeing from a peer adversary when you look towards Indopaycom, uh, we are going to have to displace very rapidly as, as formations, and that's logistics formations, sustainment formations, combat formations. You know, gone are the days of, of these large command and control nodes, and we'll have to move them. And one of those is generating power. Um, we saw some very recent you know, experimentation out at Capstone with some very good results on fuel reduction, 
being able to move very quickly and having rapid setup times when you did displace and move and set back up to command and control, make logistics decisions, make, you know, make operational decisions. I think that's the first thing. Um, there's a lot of partnership there with industry right now, but I think we've got to look at, we are already writing into our capabilities documents for our new systems that that would be part of that system. But I will tell you, um, that's probably what you wanted to hear going forward with new systems. We will always fight an army of, of three or four groups. What we have, what we're modernizing to, the undersecretary mentioned it. We're going we're gonna to give capabilities to certain formations, and certain formations will have different capabilities. We've got to look at those suite of solutions. Some of it we're going to have to go back to systems and put that technology on it. And that's the partnership, and I look forward to the dialogue on how we do that. Absolutely. It just makes sense to do it as we go forward with new development systems and, and, and more and more acquisitions. But some of the systems we exercised, and General Donahue's team was out there with me in Capstone, and the CDID was there. They're legacy systems, but the fuel savings, the maneuverability, being able to power a division main with two vehicles. That takes 11 generators off the battlefield, just as an example. Um, and I'll turn it over to General Donnie for any other comments. But absolutely great question, but that's where we're headed, I think. In, in, in the newspaper. So two things, when I, when I worked for General, General Simmerly before and I was the quartermaster commandant, um, I used to joke about being the commandant that was gonna essentially wipe out a couple of MOSs that we had uh, based off of some of the technologies that we were pursuing. And so, um, but then I also like to be known as uh, the person who likes to go find other people's money as well to be able to pursue innovation. And so in this case, uh, um, really a fan of some of the work that DevCom has been doing with OSD and a joint capability tech demo uh, over the last couple years. And that's really what reference or what Shane referenced uh, that happened out of Project Convergence in a uh, project that we called STAMP. Um, and so uh, essentially what this was, and it was actually really cool, I was walking actually the floor yesterday as all the construction was still happening uh, here, and actually saw a, a, a vendor that had an ACDC uh, power converter. And you know, essentially that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's really all that we were able to do is to be able to convert power from a truck, eliminate generators, and allow a command post on the move uh, it's, uh, it's basically be able to power itself and not have to set up its 11, it, its 11 generators. Having just spent some time with the PM last week when we were at Fort Greg Adams, he always reminds me that you know generators absolutely have a place on the battlefield, just like water production has a place on the battlefield. But at the point of need, uh, when we're seeing what we're seeing from 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 operations in uh, Ukraine and having to continuing uh, to move our command posts um, at the speed of relevance uh, to ensure that they're protected, uh, you you know we, we don't have time to set up 11 generators. So uh, so. There's some great technology out there. Lots of, um, I mean, obviously reduces fuel, but also from a survivability perspective and a, and a protection requirement, absolutely critical that we see some of uh, some of that uh, capability cut into our current programs as well as even future programs as well. Great, thank you. I, I've been digging hard for a maintenance question here, <laughs> and I found one. So, uh, good question again. Back to General Donahue and Colonel Upton. You know, historical system performance data is a critical piece of PPMX and predictive logistics. How will the Army compensate with and utilize with vehicles in the field the transmission of this health, uh, system health data? What's the plan? What's the network structure? How do you see that working? Maybe you've got some examples of some things you've discussed already that could talk about how, what the future looks like for transmission of that data. Dr. Hill, you may have some examples too. Yeah, I'm going to phone a friend here with Chris Hill in a second real <laughs> quick. I immediately, that was my first thought. We absolutely, so General Donahue mentioned that there was some great work, absolutely phenomenal work. It's a first for the Army. I'm, I'm not into first, but it was an absolute first. So Colonel Matt Western and the team at the TPO ACM, the Sustainment Mission Command, that's part of the Sustainment Center of Excellence, got an abbreviated capabilities document approved by the Army leaders to do exactly what General Masters just talked. Start moving, first focused on Abrams and some of our, our, more, our larger platforms, that maintenance data off platform, and then how we move that into things what you call a data broker, and then quite a, frankly then into an open architecture is the way we are looking at that. And that is absolutely tied also 
And General Donahue mentioned this earlier with Army Futures Command and the Army's efforts on how they pivot the network to what we call Command and Control or C2 Next. Um, it's absolutely going to have to operate on a common network. Um, I'm not a signal guy, but I'm going to quote a quote that somebody way smarter than me said. Shane, you know what server stacks are? If you have a bunch of clouds out there that don't talk to each other, it's just like server stacks that are not connected. It was this guy. But anyway, <laughs> um, but that's where we're looking at on how to transfer that maintenance data off the platform. The sensors are there. So when I look at my industry partners and the smart people in the room, the technology is there. We, the Army, have to be partners with you all and communicating that clearly what we need. And what I mean is, and there's an effort that General Donahue's actually leading us through, is deciding what commanders are going to need to make decisions. Because at the bottom end of this, at the end of this, for a commander on the battlefield, that data needs to drive a decision. Or maybe we don't need to be collecting it. That's Upton's opinion. That is not, you know, I know this is on the record. That's my opinion, but we've got to keep the commander at the center of that. And I'll turn it over to my teammates. But that's where we're looking at, and that will absolutely be written in, into the capabilities development document for the PL efforts that were started at, at you know, at this SMC, the Sustainable Mission Command, and continued in a partnership now with the CFT as teammates. So I'll just turn it over to you. So two things. Um, I'm always... a. Dr. Hill and I have been partnered for a long time and, um, and really impressed with, again, all of the efforts that they've done with APAS um, and industry help as well. Um, and I'm always reminded over the fact that he told me that um, this was uh, maybe about 18 months ago when, uh, when the cab that was in Europe uh, was uh, directed to go support uh, the, the uh, humanitarian relief operations in Turkey. And they used APAS to select all the tail numbers for those for those birds that were going to fly from uh, from I don't know if they flew from out of Greece or out of Poland I forget which one but um, but a hundred percent OR rate never broke down all of because of the analytic efforts um, that they have done. Um, I am, uh, I've been reminded about all the work that we've also done, TACOM and, and the leadership at TACOM have done with experimenting down with uh, 3ID, with the brigade down there. A lot of that work actually helped to inform the writing of our ACDD. Um, really happy to report um, uh, General Dean and team uh, inside of uh, the striker community, inside of PEO ground systems. They've done a lot of work to digitize uh, the maintenance flow of data um, inside the striker platform. Um, and so, again, there's just, a, there's, there's a tremendous amount of efforts. Um, it's almost like the data uh, piece that, that, Sean, you mentioned about decentralization. This is essentially what we've seen across the Army from a PL perspective. And so, um, and so I think we've taken a lot of really good lessons learned. And uh, with Shane and the team, we will, we will absolutely get the, the actual requirements document from, you know, transition from an ACDD to a CDD. Um, and we're hopeful that we've got some money across multiple pegs right now, but, uh, but, uh, but through uh, Shane's efforts um, to uh, centralize some of those resources, uh, we'll be able to, to, to uh, see this come to a fruition. So I would say we've, we've done a good job of moving the football on, on predictive maintenance over the last several years. Our tank automotive and armaments command on the ground side and our aviation missile command on the air. I mean, the, the things they can do with that data, uh, as General Donahue mentioned, uh, predicting failure by a tail number in specific amounts of time. Looking at their supply chain, their authorized stockage list to say the parts we think they're going to drive the failure, do we have enough for this upcoming operation? And then feeding all that back into the national supply chain is really powerful. That was a great question because I think it hit on the part of the technology that's limiting us the most, and this is where we can use industry's help. It's how do we get that data off of those platforms in an efficient way? Uh, that's secure, that's not going to compromise that unit in a combat environment. So a lot of the advances we've made, uh, we've leveraged uh, peacetime operations, being able to pull things off of vehicles directly or going to the motor pool, that sort of thing. But that's not the solution we need. We need that solution that's going to pull it from that vehicle in a secure and efficient way and provide that data back into the enterprise for us to use. And just one more. So most, sorry, real quick, Sean. So our, um, 
Most of our components are censored, but I guess what I would also challenge the industry is to take a look at the subcomponents. Um, that's actually, I think, where we see challenges, uh, where we can isolate some of those failures when it comes to the subcomponents within those major systems. I was just going to add an editorial comment. I actually, I think, uh, it's kudos to the Army. I think you guys are ahead uh, in, of the services and how you're thinking about it. Um, and I say that only to encourage us to move more quickly because I think you, you're paving a trail that others are like looking at and saying, okay, we need to be doing some of the same activities. So it's, it's encouraging. We're going to only have time for maybe two more questions. I'm going to hit one. We haven't used the word cyber in, in our discussion, uh, but I thought this one would be kind of get us off the original train. So it's, it, we all know cyber is part of a contested environment. No matter where we're at, we deal with it in personal life. Uh, this question really deals about, you know, what, to what extent do you see cyber warfare as an operational risk inside the contested environment? And, and just, you know, some quick ideas about some things that are going on. Realize there's a lot of people out there working on the cyber aspect, particularly when you get down in the tactical space. Uh, you know, what's going on in that environment? Just a little bit for the audience, please. Shane, I'll look at you start yeah, off. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So really it's a partnership with, with AMC, and I'll use a quote that I've heard General Moan say, and I've seen it published. A lot of our sustainment enterprise, that's partnership with the defense industrial base, the OIB, and our, our tactical formations operate, quite frankly, not even on controlled, you know, open internet, but open internet. And we've got to look at how we do that going forward, I think is the first thing. Um, we can't, but we can't use that and go so secretive, because I'll tell you that's, again, Upton's opinion, potentially sometimes we overclassify stuff, so that impedes the partnership with the industry. Um, but we're absolutely looking at, as we go to any capabilities document, how does a cyber contested environment play in that? And sustainment, that's huge. That's from projecting from our factories, our in, our, in that joint security support area, into the foxhole. Um, a lot of that is partnership because, you know, I, and, and General Master said it, the charter of the CFT is tactical and below, but the, one of the reasons we're closely partnering with the CASCOM, obviously, and, and then with AMC is because that's got to tie into the strategic base, and cyber is a huge piece of that. You know, we're working on this PL initiative. I know I keep pulling that thread, but that's huge in the cyber domain because any open architecture, if not protected, opens up a lot of that information. When you start talking about the centering discussion we just had on platforms, and, and Dr. Hill said it very well, we've got to look at protecting that because I'll just tell you recently in Convergence, one of the big, you had those aha moments during when you're experimenting, and our cyber EM folks came in one day and briefed the leaders at the table and showed the peaks of transmission of data when these HMI solutions, the PL type solutions were transmitting. They were enormous. Obviously, we've seen from lessons observed in Ukraine and stuff, the minute that happens, you become a target. So I think that's the way we're approaching and looking at it. Um, we'll absolutely put it in our requirements documents. You know, I, just in recent as a newer CFT and with the fellow CFTs, I've been a lot of phone of friends on how we're doing that because some of that has to be matrixed. And that's a, a reach out we'll do to industry as well because I'll tell you, Truth in Lending, the CLCFT doesn't have a cyber expert on the team, but we'll absolutely reach out to our industry partners and, and have that dialogue with people that are in that professional space. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to the rest of the team. But that's kind of where we're looking at and some of the ideas. Any comments? I, I, I know Pat said we had a little bit more than the time allotted, so please. I, 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 would, I would just say uh, to Shane's point there, and I agree with him, that we should pay very close attention to what's happening in Ukraine right now, because the cat and mouse game that's being played today uh, in the EW space is really, really interesting. And our opportunity has to be that we understand what the new modification is to the the you know the the procedure that they're using, and us to be able to actually understand what's going on and then react to that more quickly than we do today is going to be something that's going to be really important. And you overlay that with the complexity of, you know, the supply chain itself. And you can see if you can't figure out what they're doing and be able to react quickly, then suddenly your supply chain is going to be really compromised. Great. 
I am going to squeeze one more quick one in here because this, this looks like probably is Dr. Hill's review, but it seems like it might be a quick one answer. It's a, a question about how can an industry representative get access to representative data sets and access to APAS to validate and align future integrated solutions. You, any comment to the? So as I mentioned, our, uh, our architecture is very open and uh, we are very federated. So the key is you, you got to find me in the next uh, two days and uh, I will get you linked up to the right folks. So whoever asked that question, you know, take a picture, you <laughs> track him down. Uh, panel, thank you very much. And, and I apologize to the audience. I mean, you were very uh, active in your question asking. I, I tried to uh, order these and spread them around a little bit. So I apologize if I didn't get to your question, but that's the opportunity you may have. Uh, great thanks uh, again to our panel members uh, for their time and effort preparing for and the information that they've shared with all that. I hope you all took away as much from this panel discussion as I did. Uh, and thanks again, AUSA, for giving us the opportunity to talk. Thanks very much. Great America. Well, maybe an American. <laughs> so I guess everybody has taken off because they figured it was going to take me too long to make it across the stage. So we'll get this fireside chat underway. My name is Doug Morrison. I work for Susie Defense uh, as their lead for their composite rubber track business here in the U.S. But I'm also the vice president for the George Washington AUSA chapter in Northern Virginia on their executive committee for family affairs. And I'd like to take an opportunity to introduce our first fireside chat focused on integrating partnership in posture. It's my honor to introduce the moderator for this fireside chat, Lieutenant General Retired Mick Benderick. General Bednarik is a consummate warfighter. Currently, he's the Vice President of Defense for Fluor Mission Systems, excuse me, Fluor Mission Solutions. He directs the group's defense business line, providing scalable rapid response, contingency logistics, life support services, construction for military, humanitarian, and disaster, disaster response missions. <laughs> he spent nearly 40 years of service in the U.S., Europe, Middle East, and Indo-PACOM. General Benarek retired from the Army in 2015. He served as a commander at every level, from company to Army level, including CG of the 25th Infantry Division, in Schofield Barracks, Hawaii, and CG, 1st Army, headquartered at Rock Island Arsenal. For his last military assignment, he served for 26 months as the senior defense official in Iraq and the chief of the Office of Security cooperation in Baghdad. Sir, over to you. No, hey, uh, hey thanks. I appreciate that. Listen, uh, this fireside chat panel is the uh, last thing before our lunch. Some of them are, went out to go grab a sandwich. They're probably kind of eat back in here mm -hmm. against the house rules. Uh, but that's, uh, that's okay. And uh, General Brown, sir, thanks to you and Les for giving me a few extra minutes here. Maybe we get a little bit of Q and A. So we kind of started uh, a, a little bit ago. Hey, we are uh, blessed with a couple great uh, war fighters here to my left, uh, steam uh, logisticians that really are leading our army formations uh, across the spectrum of uh, of combat. And uh, hopefully, we'll get uh, some questions from the audience. Although. You know, both of these from uh, Lieutenant General Mark Simile, now the Director of Defense Logistics Agency, just a few months ago, 
and uh, Major General Eric Shirley, Commander of First uh, Theater Sustainment Command, responsible, as everybody here knows, for the depth, breadth, and scope and support of uh, COM RCENT, uh, Lieutenant General Pat Frank, and obviously a CENTCOM Commander uh, Eric Carrilla. Mm -hmm. Talk about both uh, professionals that got uh, their damn hands full on everything going on around the, around the planet. Most of us in here have been to a carnival or a circus and are pretty familiar with the uh, man that you see with a big stick spinning a bunch of plates. Well, these two individuals got a hell of a lot of plates uh, spinning in their cargo pocket, but again, we could talk for a long time just on what is in their portfolio of not only how they're doing, what they're doing, but as this AUSA Global Force Symposium is, uh, is titled in support of combat ready formations of our, our warfighters around the planet. Um, we only have about 30, 40 minutes, so we're going to try to keep this a little bit tight. And, and Eric, I want to I start with, uh, with you, if I could. And as I mentioned, you, you could talk an hour uh, just of all the stuff that you have going on across the CENTCOM area of responsibility. Everything from your headquarters there at Fort Knox to forward in Arifjan. I know you just got back, as you, were, you and I were talking earlier, from... Uh, from Jordan and uh, all points on the cardinal cardinal compass, but coming up on a on a one year in in command and leading the first TSC multi compo team of uh, a lot of our readiness and statement challenges in support of a CENTCOM and CENTCOM commander. But given the chief of staff of the Army, Randy George's, and his focus of constant transformation and contact uh, and General Carrilla's focus there in uh, CENTCOM of innovation. What opportunities are, are you seeing and have you seen in current ops across the AOR to be innovative and kind of working through those uh, challenges? And again, that's a heck of a lot and I know you could talk all day just on that, but if you could walk us through that framework a little bit for, uh, for the audience. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, sir. Thanks very much, and I'd like to say first and foremost, uh, I appreciate this opportunity. The forum for collaboration that AUSA allows us, everyone that I need to talk to to support our troops in contact, everyone that I need to coordinate with to enhance the operational reach and endurance of our joint task forces is here right now. So General Simmerly, the SDDC commander, of course, I'll see General Mohan this afternoon, and the list goes on and on. Yep. All the leaders that enable our joint logistics enterprise are here to talk to. So it's, it's just a great opportunity to be here and, and see the team. Uh, I appreciate, again, the opportunity to recognize uh, all those great, strong soldiers, strong sergeants in the Arsent team and what First TSC is doing to support those troops in contact each and every day, as well as our joint partners. And then, of course, as you said, and as the title of the uh, fireside chat gets to, our partners in theater really enable our posture. So we've got, uh, as you mentioned, sir, a great rotational team, seven brigades in theater, many of them from Compo 2 and 3, and like a snake that is constantly shedding its skin, we have forced generation that we have to look at upstream, back to the left as I see sustainment brigades, ESCs from all Compos, all the way down to the smallest personnel detachment, finance detachment, postal detachment, to enable our support to our great forces we have to start thinking about how we transform that force generation model. So what we've had some great success with recently is having the culminating training event for these units there at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Partnered with First Army, allowed us to bring in for multi-echelon training opportunities the current sustainment brigade that's on the ground now, the upcoming 364th ESC that's come out of Compo 3 yeah. from Marysville, Virginia, uh, Washington State, They'll come in and backfill uh, Brigadier General Sean Davis's great team from 13th ACSC, uh, Fort Cavazos. That team has really had a historic rotation, right? They ripped in right around September 1st and then October 7th, we were off to the races. So the expectation on our teammates that are coming into theater is just really phenomenal. They're gonna have to jump onto a moving train. The way we've adjusted those CTEs for our uh, deploying units so that we can provide them a good insight from the main command post at Knox. We sent some people back from theater to inform the training audience. 
it enables us to have more ready formations as they hit the ground. So then I look at what is our purpose as the theater sustainment command. Uh, and it is to synchronize, integrate, and deliver world-class logistic solutions for our supported commanders, and most importantly, our troops in contact. And that really is reliant not only on all the great support we get from the Department of the Army, but from the Joint Logistics Enterprise and partners like U.S. Transcom, DLA, Army Material Command, of course. So some things that we've done to write the theater, to get after the chief's intent, leveraging the opportunity of our changing operational environment in the context of uh, Israeli's uh, war against Hamas. We looked at how our C2 was arrayed last September uh, before we uh, undertook these support operations uh, for the fight that's going on in Israel. What we found is we had several of our logistics icons consolidated uh, in accordance with our legacy posture. Hmm. So a BSB, two CSSBs, all located within Kuwait. And what we undertook uh, rapidly under uh, General Davis's leadership forward in mind from the main command post was to move the BSB up north to Erbil so they can better support OIR, move a CSSB out west to support our evolving Western access network. All of these changes put more leadership forward. They give us the opportunity to synchronize, integrate, and deliver in the backyard of the supported commanders and closer to our partners that enable our posture. So we made those adjustments, and by operationalizing the Western Access Network through a series of RCEN leaders' recons and communications exercises, we found ourselves better postured to support not only the Army, but our joint forces. And we are now conducting in support of NAVCENT reload operations for destroyers that are obviously operating in support of Operation Prosperity Guardian yep. and the counter Houthi fight in the Bab al-Mandeb. But because we had the foresight to project out uh, Sustainment Brigade TAC to PSAB in Saudi Arabia and then Sean Davis's TAC uh, to seaports on the western coast of Saudi Arabia, we were ready when called upon to support that joint force. And that was just a, a great example, I think, of how we changed in, in, in contact. Uh, some of the innovation that we're getting after uh, in the CENTCOM AOR, of course, General Carrillo's focus is on people, partners, and innovation. I'll just mention a couple of examples along three lines of effort. Uh, the first being materiel. Uh, this is something that the panel alluded to a little bit earlier. How do we enable production forward for uh, critical parts? Uh, additive manufacturing, subtractive manufacturing. We have taken systems like the Army's MWMSS, uh, their metalworking uh, mul uh, multiple uh, shop sets, and placed them with that BSB up in Erbil allowing them to do critical fabrication forward for brackets for NVGs to enable man-pad uh, counter UAS systems. Just very opportune, critical parts that we can now produce at point of need. We're also, under the leadership of RCENT's Task Force 39, the innovation element of RCENT, uh, making plans for employing a additive manufacturing campus in Kuwait. And we'll do that co-located with uh, the support units that still remain in Kuwait because that is our main point for projecting forces north in support of both Operation Spartan Shield as well as Inherent Resolve. From a technology perspective, uh, we're innovating by using autonomous transport vehicles. Now, those ATVS systems, we've pursued a very aggressive crawl, walk, run system. Proofing and training crews at the Udari Range Complex taking those systems down into the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for the Red Sands exercises, counter UAS and BDOC training that we did with partner nations. We lengthened the legs, made a little bit more demands on the technology as they were used in conjunction with those exercises. And then we're looking out for our run phase for a near-term exercise where we will move ATVS systems uh, with soldiers in the cab, of course, for, for safety. But in conjunction with Marsent elements as they transit the totality of the Trans-Arabian network. We'll really put these systems through their paces and I think give a ton of inter enterprise uh, level feedback to Shane CFTs and the enterprise. Very, very uh, ideal terrain uh, to use these systems. Using them in a large scale theater security cooperation exercise with our partners, I think just helps us to continue to be the partner of choice and offer technology solutions for our partner nations that they're really not going to find anywhere else. Uh, finally, I would say uh, on a third line of effort, data. Uh, obviously, we're all desperately working against the clock to leverage and enhance 
uh, how we collaborate uh, using our data so that we can enable predictive logistics, so that we can enable uh, predictive maintenance. I will give you uh, one of the real world experiences we had uh, post October 7th. We flowed into theater several ADA units, both Patriot and THAAD systems. Uh, a real commitment of national level resources with some 200 odd C-17 aircraft flowing in, landing around the clock in theater. Understanding that, describing it, and helping make decisions and recommendations for senior leaders at the speed of relevance, the speed of war, was a challenge. As we had to query multiple systems of record, see the uh, status of munitions and units, whether that be Advana, Tamus, Sasmod, G Army, you pick the system, we were moving from system to system. What we've done since then is working with CASCOM, G4, and others, identify the challenges that we saw across the dot mill PFP perspective, uh, and then work to get to that common single pane of glass for logistics collaboration, and at least in CENTCOM, that's done with the Maven system. And so now what we're able to do is multi-echelon collaboration on a single reference point for our sustainment planning and decision support. I think it's, uh, it's been very productive. We went from, in September and October timeframe, having very few uh, authorized users to now a great level of competency using Maven. All of my commander's update briefs, all of our ONIs, all of our coordination with our and CENTCOM is now done on that Maven solution. I think as professional logisticians, we're agnostic to which technology solution we use, but I would tell you now as we look at the emerging humanitarian assistance mission into Gaza, yeah. I think everybody's tracking, we're already doing aerial delivery. We're about to enable joint logistics over the shore. And as we look at the geography, we have uh, inherent cross-COCOM coordination. So Ron Reagan at 21st TSC, a great teammate, helped us out with uh, airdrop resupply. But now we're at a place where we're going to project humanitarian assistance over the shore from locations in the MED, which are inherently COCOM, uh, UCOM, to CENTCOM. I need to be able to collaborate in a uh, similar space with my TSC partners and my joint logistics enterprise partners. Uh, so that's one that we have started to take those steps on. I think Maven is a, a great innovation that we're using uh, for data dominance, and it's one that's allowing us to speak in common terms of reference with our supporting uh, joint logistics enterprise partners. And so uh, beyond technical innovation, uh, I would say that uh, focusing on people and partners in CENTCOM uh, really beyond our joint forces, we have to understand that our purpose is in part to do uh, our level best to generate opportunities for interoperability with our partners so that we remain the partner of choice across the AOR because partners in the region enable our posture. ABO, our ability to work uh, with some level of autonomy is always going to be conditioned by the sovereign interests of the nations that we work with. And now, as everybody knows, within uh, the arson area where there's not a NATO structure that allows for yeah. common terms of reference for dip clearance and movement across uh, national borders. But we have to do that on a daily basis, whether moving from Kuwait through Saudi Arabia to Jordan or back UAE and other partners in the, in the region, all critical, but all with their own unique requirements for processing movement requests and dip clearance. So one of the things that we've done, uh, and I think it's paid great dividends, is CENTCOM's approach to theater security cooperation exercises with multilateral engagements like the SANS exercises that provide common reference for counter UAS and BDOC to enhance force protection, not only for US forces, but for our regional partners. And a place where we saw that be very, very successful was in November with uh, the Houthis uh, one-way attack UAS and land attack cruise missiles the work that was put in in the counter UAS space through the Red Sands exercises and the regional security construct where all of the nations collaborate on these technologies allowed them to defeat a massive uh, launch by the Houthis of those systems. And subsequent to that, those TTPs have continued to be very, very successful. Again, because of our partnership, because of the posture and the uh, advances that it allows us. And then finally, I think uh, as we talk about partnerships for the TSC perspective, certainly from our main command post at Fort Knox. I've got yeah. to project up and out and talk to not only the Department of the Army,
but the Joint Logistics Enterprise Partners. And we've done just a great, great job, I think, of one, being good teammates, not surprising and identifying requirements ahead of time, and then DLA, AMC, US Transcom can make those adjustments with our industry partners to better support uh, the troops and the joint service members uh, across CENTCOM's AOR. So just a couple of examples from Transcom, AMC, and DLA. Uh, I mentioned the, the massive lift uh, that Transcom enabled moving ADA assets into theater in the October and November timeframe last year. Uh, that is now matched by their commitment of aircraft to support the uh, aerial resupply of humanitarian assistance. Uh, AFSINT has been critical in delivering hundreds of thousands of meals and with the joint partners that are also operating in theater, that's well over the million. We are going to vastly increase that when we start multimodal humanitarian assistance yeah. going through JLOTS and, and ideally, ultimately, uh, through ground lines of communication. In working with our AMC partners, of course, AMCOM is just critical to everything we do from a air defense uh, perspective and keeping our aviation systems in the fight. I look forward to talking to uh, General O'Connor here uh, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we've also got uh, the counter UAS um, focus for all things force protection. We really, not only with AMCOM and AMC, but rely on DLA, uh, DLA Aviation, and then of course our industry partners. We have seen just great success with uh, counter UAS systems in theater with novel approaches to new technology, everything from the man packable drone buster systems, the FS lids and M lids, and then the very successful Coyote uh, counter UAS system. We watched that production rate from the Raytheon facility in Arizona uh, like hawks, and they immediately moved from the production line to the flight line to rotary wing support for distribution across uh, the OIR footprint uh, so that we can protect our forces. Well, uh, you got some history there in Arizona, so. Absolutely, yeah, so <laughs> that's home. Uh, when, they, when they said go to the Tucson plant and uh, engage with industry, I raised my hand, but uh, other leaders got to take that on. And then finally, sir, I would say for our partnerships, uh, there's none more important to what we're doing in the CENTCOM AOR than the Defense Logistics Agency. Uh, and I had the great benefit, as did General Simmerly of Command and uh, DLA Troop up in yep. Philadelphia. Yep. And those great teammates provide everything from the class one that we're dropping on a uh, every other day basis for humanitarian assistance. Uh, every bit of subsistence goes to every joint member, medical supplies, construction and equipment that provides for our force protection enhancements. Constantly pressing uh, from the headquarters. We're in constant collaboration with the DLA J3 and the MSC commanders so that we don't surprise and that we can also leverage industry's capacity to quickly bring those resources to bear. But, you know, I. As you said, sir, I could talk for an hour. I, I need to stop uh, <laughs> so that I can turn it over to the real subject matter expert uh, for DLA, uh, Lieutenant General Simmons. Yeah, no, hey, uh, Eric, I appreciate it. You, you highlighted uh, a couple things. I'll try to get back to it here with time available because I know we had some, there's people up there in the $1 section that kind of came in after we started here. But you highlighted multiple examples of uh, my analogy of, you know, the circus guy with sticks spinning a bunch of plates, whether that is, you know, the capability in Erbil, what's going on in Gaza, uh, your recent visit to, to Jordan, uh, on and on and on. You also highlighted a couple things of uh, your, the, the, the multi-compo, right. you know, our compo two and compo three uh, teammates our Guard and Reserve, and General Brand, you know, we've got some uh, former state adjutant generals that are here in this audience, so that absolutely resonates with the readiness of the total force and the total army, as you kind of highlighted. And the other acronym I kind of scribbled down of the Joint Interagency Intergovernmental Multinational Capability. Uh, but now also, and we'll get to this, of course, one of the reasons that we're here is the full spectrum of the defense industrial base, which is part of that JIIM acronym that we used to use as a matter of routine. But uh, hey, uh, it's uh, Eric, you, you're spot on. And again, could have taken another hour. Hey, uh, Mark, let me turn to you for, for a little bit. Um, General Simile, as I mentioned, uh, recently took the helm as the director of the Defense Logistics Agency. And you, although as, as uh, Eric kind of highlighted, combatant command focus there in the CENTCOM area of responsibility. 
there's some more going on there than Dones has pills. But from the DLA perspective, you know, bottom line, it is a broader global focus. All combatant commands and everything that uh, not only our army, but all of the joint force in our nation touches. End-to-end uh, -end global supply chain activities that impacts uh, all of us. And the sheer magnitude of the Defense Logistics Agency is daunting. And, and Eric, you kind of highlighted, you know, old teammates there at DLA troop support there in Philly. And uh, Mark, you know this well, uh, DLA Aviation, Richmond, Virginia, uh, Land and Maritime up in Ohio, uh, even the energy team you have there with you at, uh, at Fort Belvoir. And, and we talked a little bit earlier about uh, the DLA's focus of continuous transformation and people, precision, posture, and partnership. Mm. So here's a question for you. Is, you're kind of taking, uh, taking over the helm there at the Defense Logistics Agency. How does DLA calibrate and synchronize that posture that you, that you spoke of earlier in concert with the combatant commands that, uh, that Eric kind of walked out and the service components and the broad spectrum uh, in terms of setting the theaters, we kind of look to the long term. Um, talk to us a little bit about that if you could, Mark. Sir, thanks for the question, and I'd like to begin by thanking General Brown and the AUS team, AUSA team, for inviting me to participate. It's not often at AUSA we get the Defense Logistics Agency director <laughs> participate, so I'm grateful for that. Nice. Uh, but I'm also grateful for the forum, and uh, in addition to you know what I learned listening to Eric today uh, and the other panel members and, and other speakers, uh, the questions and engagement we'll have with industry will be very. Uh, informative to us and my team and DLA uh, all together as we look at the way the, the Army's talking about transformation uh, and the way the industry is looking at how they can provide solutions to that. Certainly all applicable questions and solutions to DLA as we look at our mission set. And, and most of you know that DLA's charter is to be the nation's combat logistics support agency. And I would focus on that word combat. Uh, within that realm. We were born out of lessons learned from combat during World War II uh, <laughs> on how we could gain efficiency and effectiveness in sustaining the force. Uh, and, and we really see our responsibility as providing readiness to the services and then endurance and resilience to the COCOMs. Uh, and there's a lot of other mission sets within that. And you described you know, some of our uh, uh, major subordinate commands. I would add to them as, as well our DLA distribution uh, team uh, has a glo global uh, mission uh, and also our disposition services which helps yeah. on the back end of operations yep. uh, so we can continue that support so not only supply chains eight major supply chains but also services that we provide to the uh, the, co the combatant commands and the services as well uh, and, and the scope of mission is global as you said uh, and it, it's a truism, but it's worth repeating that the sun never sets on DLA, just like the sun never sets on, D, on DOD as well, right? So where the DOD exists, the DLA has to be uh, as well. And I was very fortunate uh, in about my sixth week of my tenure as a director, which was like last week, <laughs> uh, I got a chance to travel with the service fours, mm -hmm. the joint staff J4 uh, led the team along with Arnold Lohman from OSDS. Uh, out into Indo-PACOM, and we went to Japan, the Philippines, Australia, and I had a chance to cap it off in Hawaii to meet with some of the Indo-PACOM uh, leadership to look at some of the challenges we have there. Uh, and one of the takeaways, and Eric really highlighted this uh, in his comments, uh, is that none of our supply chains, none of our support exists uh, within a single COCOM. They're all interrelated. And so when we make a decision uh, in one portion of the world, there's a prioritization and an impact in another part of the world uh, that we have to consider. Uh, and I, I will tell you the uh, recent relationship we have with Transcom and the management of bulk fuel is a really good example of how we can manage this from a prioritization standpoint, where we look at and, and weigh the, the uh, balance of requirements in one COCOM for bulk fuel versus another. Some of the things we've done in the Red Sea recently are a pretty good example of that. We brought in assets for distribution of fuel from another COCOM uh, so we could enable our naval assets not to have to go to an ashore facility for fuel, continue their operations, and also allow them to operate more securely. The provision of Class 1, as mentioned, as a good example as well, taking stocks from one COCOM to another for humanitarian aid uh, in Gaza. 
uh, and uh, being able to generate the uh, supply chain pr from a production standpoint in CONUS so it could sustain that without any concerns from the combatant commander about any restrictions uh, on available supply. Uh, so as you mentioned, you know, we, we are very concerned about um, this transformative period and what DLA's role is within that to enable the services and the COCOMs. And, and we very much understand our responsibility um, inherent within that, our relationships and supporting the COCOMs, uh, but also the benefit we have from the relationships with each of the services and COCOMs. And not only is it a transformative era for the Army, it's a transformative era for the entire DOD. And if you listen to the language and the concepts of all the services and their focus on, on transformation, there's very, very many common touch points, but also there's some nuances that it, it pays uh, dividends for us to uh, note and share with others. So that's part of what we can do uh, is share some of those lessons learned, some of those TTPs that we're picking up, not only from our, our U.S. warfighting partners, uh, but also a lot of the allies and partners in, in, in whose country we operate as well. Uh, so as you mentioned, you know, we, we do have a framework for the way we're looking at transformation uh, within the Defense Logistics Agency. It's, it's people, it's precision, it's posture, and it's partnerships. Uh, and I'll start off with people because, as we know, culture always precedes performance. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, within the Defense Logistics Agency, 98% civilian, about 45% uh, uh, having served in uniform before, but throughout the agency, this warfighting spirit and the yeah. sense of the warfighters. But how do we inform that so it's relevant, not only to the challenges today, but the challenges of the future, so we can understand our decisions uh, and our, our actions from the lens of, of the contested logistics environment. Uh, and it is a shift for us as we understand that from uh, the, the lens of the COCOMs and of the services as they prepare uh, to uh, face those threats. Uh, so we have to ensure that that's uh, built into our acumen, that warfighting acumen. We can understand that uh, where we've had to operate in some cases in the past based upon an efficiency model, especially in the post-Cold War era. Uh, we also now have to account for the resiliency that's going to be required uh, in any given theater. Uh, and, and that has to be part of our culture as well. Uh, and then there's also acumen that we have to achieve within our culture. And the acumen that we have, and is you know one of our traditional strengths, is our ties to industry. Our ability to speak with them, to translate our requirements, warfighting requirements to them in ways that are actionable. Uh, so that's something that's going to be an enduring capability that we have to maintain. Uh, but also now this, this uh, data acumen where we can employ data effectively and we can use it for decision making. We can use it for the way we design our tools uh, to help us make decisions uh, and also the way that we visualize requirements. Yep. Uh, so this data acumen is something that we have to achieve not only from a, a recruiting standpoint, but also from a developmental standpoint uh, within our existing teams. Um, and then a final thing I'll say about, about uh, people, uh, it's this cultural acumen in terms of cross-cultural relationships we have to have, certainly within our, our, uh, our joint forces uh, and then also with our allies and partners uh, where we can understand where we're operating, the conditions under which uh, they're operating and what their uh, view of re requirements are, responsibilities are. Last week in the Philippines, it was really remarkable to me to see their motivation increase uh, for collaboration with the U.S. Uh, and you know, we could say that relationship is on hyperdrive right now. So what does that mean for DLA? Uh, and especially as we look at the specific things that we provide from fu food, fuel, the other commodities from a distribution standpoint, how do we have to uh, tailor and adjust our approach to them uh, from a people standpoint? Yeah, it's a good point on the on the cultural piece, but even some of our coalition partners and allies, the national caveats that they have they have to there's some of those are constraints that they have to work with, and then from all of us, got to understand us. Uh, you're right. Absolutely, and I think it factors in in the posture as well. But I want to talk about precision first. Uh, so, as a second uh, element of our framework for transformation, uh, is we know that precision is going to allow us to afford sustainment. It's going to allow us to achieve mass. It's going to allow us to achieve precision. Uh, and as mentioned before on one of the, the previous panels, uh, we cannot afford to be imprecise uh, in where we decide to 
stock things, how we decide to move things, uh, and, and what we stock. Uh, so we have to be able to partner with the services, the COCOMs, to have a very precise view of requirements, and then translate those with precision to industry. Uh, we, we can't afford to have vague, ambiguous requirements if we want to have specific performance on their part uh, that's tied to um, a specific time, a specific place, and a specific way that it's got to be provided. Uh, so that a, a lot of that precision is focused upon our ability to develop and utilize information systems. Uh, and we're in the middle of a transformational era in our own information systems. Uh, it's, you know, the uh, digital business transformation is our program that's, that's underway. And we're, you know, delivering a new weapon system, our warehouse management system into all of our distribution and disposition sites right now. So a major information system uh, transition that's taking place uh, and many other tools that we're using uh, that we're developing in, in many cases in, in partnership with the Army uh, and all the other services, so a best of breed approach uh, that we can take. And we see a responsibility we have there to enable precision on, this, uh, on the services standpoint, uh, where in many cases the services will be focused on the tactical fight, like you know, our CLCFT focused on the division and below. Yep. You know, we can see the nexus of the, our networks with industry and the, the government networks. Uh, and we can also see then the opportunities from the strategic lens uh, down to the operational and tactical level. So I think we have a unique responsibility to ensure that we are able to embed precision uh, into our uh, capabilities. And then from a posture standpoint, and I really look at posture uh, in three categories, presence, position, and stance. And so one of the things that DLA is able to do is, is have a physical presence in many parts of the world where we can have our subject matter expertise in fuel, uh, in food, you know, name a commodity and distribution as well, uh, forward located uh, with either key leaders, for instance, mm. in a DDoC, uh, certainly in, in uh, you know, ASCCs and, and other uh, combatant command oh, posts, uh, but, but also in those different nations uh, where we can help to influence decisions, we can help manage uh, access, uh, and uh, ensure that we can deliver it at the time of need. So, you know, I would say that, that uh, presence is not only about having people there, but also understanding how we can get there. And so, you know, Eric mentioned the access, the basing, the overflight, the permissions, uh, which, especially if you're not operating in a coalition environment, is different in every single nation, you know, every international border that you cross. It takes time to work. So that presence gives us the expertise so we know how to get in and how to get commodities in, uh, but it also gives us the relationship. So as we see in, in CENTCOM, UCOM, uh, Indopaycom, this campaigning approach gives us the benefit of that presence so that we have those relationships. We know how to uh, negotiate uh, the, the, the means to provide material and to operate in a, in a given theater. Uh, the positioning piece, I think, is where we, you know, most, most, most of the time we think about posture, where we put stuff, where we put commodities uh, across the world. Uh, and, and certainly that's always something that we're weighing. For instance, you know, in, in the Indo-PACOM um, uh, AOR, we've got over 65 defense fuel supply points, and they are strategically located. Mm -hmm. But are they sufficient for what we think we're going to need? No, they're not. We don't have access to bulk fuel in every place that we know we're going to need it and the combatant uh, command is going to need it. Uh, so we're, we're constantly reviewing opportunities to have a better position. And this is, by the way, where precision comes in. So we can be very precise about what we need to put into a place uh, and, and where it needs to be and then how we can afford it in a, in a uh, competition standpoint. Uh, how it makes sense for our material enterprise. We know that posture has a price, uh, and we know that resources are very limited. Uh, so how can we go about using some of the unique capabilities within DLA to establish uh, the pre-positioning of material in an affordable way? Uh, and, and as uh, you, know, we, you and I spoke about earlier, uh, being able to do that from a campaigning context where yep. we can have a presence there that supports current operations that will also give us greater capability during contingency. For the, uh, for the, uh, for the long term. Um, perfect segue, both of you. We got a, just a couple minutes left. But one of the uh, questions I got from the audience, so the, a few that we got in the time remaining, a vast majority of people that are here at this conference represent what? 
Well, they represent the, uh, the defense industrial base. Uh, so a question they got is, um, what should our defense partners across the industry, primes, vendors, small businesses, et cetera, what should they be doing as they kind of look to 2025 and beyond now that you know budget's been released, et cetera, but as they kind of look to the future, how can they better anticipate future requirements uh, to support you? Eric, any, uh, one minute, one second, a couple thoughts? Sure, so all things force protection, obviously. Uh, force pro. In the uh, sub, uh, subsequent to October 7th, uh, you know, unfortunately we lost uh, three soldiers January 28th. Yep. Uh, to a one-way attack UAS. Force Pro had always been top of mind, and now it has just picked up the pace. So everything that deals with counter UAS systems, hardening positions in a joint and expeditionary environment that protects our soldiers from that UAS threat that we're seeing, uh, certainly something to make sure that's being forecast back to uh, both our and CENTCOM so that we can bring it into those innovation labs at Task Force 39, Task Force 59 for the maritime component. But I would tell you that uh, CENTCOM is an ideal place to innovate and experiment with these new technologies. So us being able to see what industry has to offer through forums like this yep. allows us to reach out, partner with uh, industry that might have something unique, novel, might not be ready to scale, but get it into yeah, an exercise in the CENTCOM okay. AOR. Our partners uh, are hungry for it. They love the opportunity to go out with our uh, theater security cooperation exercises, those that are already planned, and then embed into it uh, a new facet for innovation. Yeah. Uh, and in, in some cases, humanitarian assistance, how we better deliver that and distribute that, and how we can communicate with the intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, that'll be important not only in Gaza, but I think going going forward into the future. Yeah, so a couple opportunities yeah. in that come. Mark, closing well, comment. Thank you. That, that uh, question allows me to talk about partnerships, which is the last <laughs> component of BLA transformation. Uh, and our partnerships with industry are critical. Last week, the Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, had a, a speech and she said that production is deterrence. Uh, so, you know, and we know from our history that uh, the only way that America can prepare for war is through American private industry. Uh, and in the private enterprise. Uh, so our reliance upon private industry is profound. Uh, you know, here's what I would recommend. Number one, as I mentioned before, within your own culture, have an embedded understanding of what combat means, what the contested logistics environment means as well as you shape your solutions. Uh, number two, uh, take an eye towards your own data acumen. And I know in many cases it's much stronger on the private side than it is on the government side. Uh, but how can you develop tools and best practices from the commercial realm uh, that are tailored and customized for uh, defense logistics use uh, and also for the entire department? And the final thing is interoperability. Uh, as you design solutions, we really need solutions that can partner with other solutions uh, and other um, capabilities, not ones that are exquisite, that are isolated. Uh, but ones that can be uh, employed from an open architecture yeah, standpoint. Uh, perfect, perfect way to end because without industry, there is no defense. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please give a uh, warm thanks to our panel up here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's over to you, sir. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Let's give them another round of applause. It's time for our networking break and lunch in the South and East Hall, sponsored by Huntington Ingalls. Please be back here in your seats by 2.15 as we start off our afternoon session with the Senior Enlisted Leader Panel. Thank you. You ready? All right. Good afternoon. My name is Rhonda Sutton. I am the third region president for AUSA. Thank you. And I previously served as the chapter president for the Redstone Huntsville chapter, so welcome to my hometown. I'm proud to introduce the moderator for this afternoon's panel, Command Sergeant Major Retired Julie Jarrah. Julie entered the Army in 1994. She held various key roles during her career of over 30 years. Julie is currently serving as the director of NCO and soldier programs for AUSA managing the support for chapters across the region, leader development, life skills training, 
publications, website management, moderator, event management, podcast moderator, and social media content manager, while continuously educating and connecting young leaders with their community and AUSA. Ladies and gentlemen, Command Sergeant Major Retired Julie Guerra. Yeah, Julie. I'm here for the woos. Uh, good afternoon. I just had to make sure. Thank you, Rhonda. I appreciate that intro. Uh, she said, I'm retired Sergeant Major Julie Guerra. I am the director of NCO and Soldier Programs at AUSA. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of moderating four senior sergeants major on the topic of transforming contact and precision sustainment. To my, le to my right is Sergeant Major Brian Hester at Army Futures Command, Command Sergeant Major Jimmy Sellers at Army Material Command, Command Sergeant Major Ray Harris at Training and Doctrine Command, and Command Sergeant Major Dusty Jones of the West Virginia National Guard. We will now start with opening comments. Sergeant Major Hester, over to you. Is it working? It is. All Just right, talk. fantastic. Well, a little green light didn't come on. So Julie has nine jobs that she's doing. So she's doing a fantastic job. So hey, everybody, good afternoon. Um, really, uh, really happy to be here. Excited to, to sit on this panel with, uh, with these gentlemen to my right and with Julie. Um, so focusing on continuous transformation, and, and I kind of posed the question of why. So, so the character war is changing. So innovation, technology, weapons proliferation, you know, integrated economies are all changing the character of war. But the nature of war remains consistent. So for the Army, that means we have to be consistent as a dominant land force. We have to be able to seize, control, and provide options for our nation. And we may just have to stab somebody in the neck and set some things on fire along the way. So we got to be ready and we got to continue to transform. So our Army has always been innovative, always modernized, and always transformed, but we have to continue to do that, and really there, we have to continue to do that at 10x to our adversary. So um, what are the challenges to maintain this dominance? So I'd, I'd just like to give you five. I think General Rainey talks about these just about everywhere he goes, but we have to be able to employ a formation-based approach to lethality and survivability. <coughs> We have to increase the lethality and survivability of our light formations, decrease the weight and sustainment of our heavy formations, and I'm sure Jimmy will talk a little bit about that. We have to be able to integrate humans and machines, and then we have to be able to field a data-centric army. So when we think about how we're going to transform in contact, we think about it really in three periods of time. But before we talk about the three periods of time, I'd like to just give you a couple of the first principles that we'd like to think about with regard to continuous transformation. The first is it has to be threat driven. It has to focus on specific technologies for the disciplined information or innovation and broad adoption. We have to execute within our existing budget, as you can imagine. Um, we got to defest of legacy systems to create assets for investment in new technologies. And then we have to reduce the complexities for our staffs at the brigade and below level. But as I described, we think about it in three periods of time, and I'm gonna really quickly go over those three periods of time, and then I'm gonna pass it over to Jimmy. So the first period of time really is transformation and contact, and that is innovating new, or bringing new capabilities to our formations within 18 to 24 months with very little dot mill PFP wraparound. The second period of time that we think about is, is deliberate transformation, and that's really focused on the first FIDEP. That's two to seven years. And for, for everybody in the, in the audience, that's really just focused on our six modernization priority, um, priorities, which have been consistent really for about the last five to six years. And then the third period of time, which is concept-driven transformation, and that's really investment in future capabilities. That's the second and the third FIDEP, really, you know, seven to 15 years, and that's, that's focusing on delivering those, those new and innovative ways to, to maintain our land dominance, which is where I really started. So I'm excited to be here, and I look forward to, to answering any questions you have. Jimmy, over to you, my friend. Hey, thanks, Brian. Hey, so a couple of things right off the bat. As we talk about this uh, holistically, AMC is really clearly focused on delivering ready combat formations. And as the Chief of Staff of the Army, the Sergeant Major of the Army, really uh, laid that out for us beginning last year, 
uh, at the October AUSA. I think our commanders have done a phenomenal job at identifying key tasks which help us focus on delivering ready combat formations, continuous transformation, strength and profession, and then the most important one in everybody's mind should be war fighting, because that's why we exist. So what is AMC's role in that? As we make things better in the Joint Strategic Support Area, or the garrison, all the way to the tactical edge. And as we talk about precision sustainment and everything that, that involves, I think gone are the days in which you know, we have 10 operating days of supply and equipment on hand, uh, really just stacked up in the back of the, the FOB or the BSA, uh, just waiting to be used, and sometimes it get expired. Now we're looking at how do we get that to the point of need, uh, all the way from the factory to the foxhole, and then from the foxhole to the factory, understanding that there's sensors along the way that's helping us analyze and put together those data points to where we can make sure that we're getting the right days of supply and equipment on hand uh, to the right unit location so that we can be more precise with our resources that we're managing. Uh, so I think that's kind of very important. But before we even get to you know, the war fighting function of that, we, we have to get better at uh, making sure that our barracks and modernization efforts are, are really improved. Everything that our soldier touches we have to make sure it's sustained uh, within the Joint Strategic Support Area. Um, the barracks, the dining facilities, modernization efforts when we touch that, and it's that whole food ecosystem uh, that's gonna help us produce uh, great warriors so when they get on the battlefield, they can survive. The next thing I think that we have to take a good, strong look at is how are we gonna move in a dynamic area of uh, multi-domain operations and make sure that we have sustainment on the move through large-scale combat operations? Being able to fix, arm, and fuel uh, forward and making sure that we are, are not a stagnant organization that is really just standing still because there are gonna be things out there through innovation uh, that was gonna make us known uh, to the enemy. And so we have, as we get out there, and start looking at that, you know, how are we gonna be uh, able to provide that multifunctional logistician, non-commissioned officer that is able to read data, understand data, and then get those requirements uh, to the commander as required. There's an issue that we're looking at um, as we talk about delivering ready combat formations. You, you can't do that while in the garrison environment effectively and efficiently if we don't have um, trained and ready, you know, unit level supply sergeants, clerks, and things of that nature that are accounting for commander's property. And where we've sound, found some uh, excess property at, you know, we established our rapidly uh, redistribute excess of equipment, R2E, as we divest in obsolete equipment, unburdening company commanders and supply sergeants from all the excess equipment they've been carrying around. And, and sometimes you, you can take a look at property books. There's probably about 16 to 20 pages of property uh, and 50% of that is excess in, in some cases. So how do we use and leverage technology uh, to get rid of the excess, redistribute that property uh, into the hands of other commanders that can actually use it and it may not be in the wrong spots. And then the last thing is before I pass it over to uh, the trade officer Sergeant Major, as we're taking a look at multifunctional logistics NCOs, uh, as we go through several uh, troop analysis cuts um, through TAA, through the total armor analysis, how do we expand on the capabilities and the capacity that we have in our single NCOs by educating them in the PME, making sure that they got the right level of education so that when they graduate, they go back to the commanders uh, and the leaders, and they're basically force multipliers within the organizations. So training, educating, certifying, and then delivering back to the organization so that it can be able to form uh, in a multifaceted organization uh, and effectively out there in the battlefield. One of those things that we're taking a look at is Project Warrior, right? So if you got a, a non-commissioned officer, for example, that's out in the CTC, that's doing the CTC rotation for two years, they've got some sets and reps on how things should be in the operational environment. They understand task, condition, and standards. They're trained and proficient. 
And then you might want to take that same non-commissioned officer and, and put them in a TRADOC environment and take the operational experience and put that onto uh, the institutional domain and just make that non-commissioned officer better. And I think a complementary of both of those skill sets within one NCO uh, will help us develop the multifunctional piece that we're trying to get codified and cultivated throughout our core. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass it over to Sergeant Major Harris, going to talk to you a little bit about the TRADOC aspect of this. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy, and and thanks for you know everybody being here and listening to us, and really looking forward to the questions because I think the meat and potatoes of, of what all of us have uh, is really in the questions. But you know, to, for for Tradoc's role, really to underpin you know the point of this conference too with continuous transformation to deliver combat ready forces um, is really the institutional domain of how do we get there, the doctrine, the training, the leader leader development and education are the things that we take a look at. Um, you just heard Sergeant Major Sellers, Jimmy, really talk about a multifunctional lo logistician or sustainment NCO. Um, we got to owe that in the training domain to say this is how we're able to deliver this capability to you that's trained, validated, certified, educated to go out there and lead those forces. And so we do that through, like I said, the DTLE process, um, and we stay nested. And so our core focus area, based off the Chief of Staff of the Army, is strengthen the Army profession, and with that comes our standards of disciplines and our uh, promise to deliver on trained, validated, educated leaders to go back out to the operational force that's reinforced by unit training, education, and training management. Um, and so we, we, as we take a look at continuous transformation, so does our education and institution, uh, institutional foundry training and functional tr uh, schools, we got to be able to transform PME and education in contact. And to do that, we got to make sure that all the education we provide to the Army is adaptable, flexible, and builds readiness for commanders in order to deploy and win when asked to do so. Uh, and so we're going to take a look at that in order to support the continuous transformation uh, focus area and able to deliver combat ready forces through trained, capable non-commissioned officers that are able to lead these small unit formations to go fight and win. Uh, and we'll do this through sequential and progressive training like we always have as we look at the soldierization continuum uh, from private basic training all the way till it's time to you to hang the suit up and retire from the Army and give back with your knowledge uh, and experience back to the force so we can continue to educate. Uh, so just want to drop a little bit of that real, right there and then I'm really looking forward to the question. So, Dusty. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to be up here on the stage with uh, my distinguished colleagues here, but uh, especially to represent the 336,000 Army National Guardsmen out there. Uh, across our 54 states, territories, and the District of Columbia. Uh, transformation and contact is something that's uh, really, uh, ob for obvious reasons, the National Guard provides around 50% of the combat power for the United States Army. So uh, it's exceptionally important so that we can restain, uh, remain relevant when it comes to multi-domain operations. But there's a significant, uh, there's significant other challenges when you talk modernization in the National Guard. You know, number one being time, and two being money. Um, so 20, the Army of 2030, we have one priority division that's in the first wave of modernization. Uh, they'll, they'll transfer right along with their Compo 1 uh, counterparts to make them uh, at the essential effective area for multi-domain operations. Uh, but the most, the, the greatest amount of our forces in the National Guard are going to remain ready and relevant through cascading modernization. So as equipment starts to be replaced, as it's still relevant, it rolls down. Um, essentially, we'll only have around 10% of our power, uh, of our combat power that will be on initial wave uh, level with our Compo 1 counterparts. But it's really important for us to stay tied in because interoperability and compatibility in multi-domain operations is exceptionally important. Um, and it can't be just in time readiness. You know, especially when you're talking C2 elements with C2 fix and communications, if it's not intuitive enough, then a guardsman can learn it really quickly over a couple of days. It has to be a more deliberate process as we have limited time to train up on equipment and generally your fielding initiatives only provide you know a base level of uh, functionality you have to get out and get reps and sets with that equipment 
in a, in a simulated combat environment to get to build true readiness. So um, working really closely as an enterprise from Compo 1, Compo 2, and Compo 3 to make sure that the strategy is unified and moving forward uh, together so that we can provide the best, uh, the best, asset, the best product for the American taxpayers. So, um, looking forward to questions. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to pull the thread a little bit about something that both Sergeant Major Sellers and Sergeant Major Harris mentioned, and that's the multifunctional logistics NCO. So for those that have never heard of this, what exactly is it? Um, how are these NCOs managed, and why is this a result of Army structure changes? Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, how we got out of this and the why, and then I guess Sergeant Major Harris can kind of hit out there the execution piece of it. But if you think about multifunctional um, logistics NCOs from where we've been thinking about it, we've been doing this for quite some time. I mean, if you take a look at Compost 2 and 3, uh, they got a, a number of MOSs after their name tag, right? Two, three, four, just like what Julie had. She had five or six different jobs, <laughs> as we talked about it this morning on the bio, right? Um, but it's, it's kind of really simple. When I talk about from a multifunctional NCO perspective, it is, uh, and I want to be clear when we say this, right, because people really get confused and they don't understand it. It is not every NCO at every grade level because we really want to maintain that technical expertise at the sergeant and staff sergeant level. That's, that's really important. Where we think we can get into the multifunctional aspect of this uh, within the sustainment community is training them at the sergeant first class level, really certifying and validating them at SLC revamping the education, um, making sure that they understand support operations, operations aspect of it, and just how to be a leader within the sustainment community. So foundationally, that's what they'll get. And then given the experience when they graduate there to do another job outside of their career field, managing a commodity, and there's MOS immaterial positions out there you can do that in. First sergeant being one, support operations being the second one, the S3 operations job at Echelon uh, being another one. So there's clear examples uh, where that always happens. You don't have to be a certain MOS uh, to go out and effectively lead soldiers. Uh, so those positions be coded as such and uh, be talent managed based off the skill set of that individual. And then I think Ray will talk a little bit about how we're going to get after that too from a doctrine perspective. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. And I'll, just to, to dovetail on that, too, and part of that is, you know, one, it's, it's opportunity building. Um, and two, part of that is self-development alone, right? The, the institutional domain about what, what we're going to teach in the POI that we'll train for a multifunctional uh, NCO is not the end-all of be-alls of the training of what that multifunctional NCO is going to get. So the self-development unit development is going to matter. Um, the good thing about this is that we've had the POI uh, we've been developing the POI for a little bit in the training that we're going to do in SLC. And so, you know, SLC, this won't be another class that we now create a whole new class. We're going to revamp the POI into the existing structure that we currently have in order to develop the multifunctional non-commissioned officer at SARM first class level uh, for the sustainment community, for, for SARM major sellers uh, and the team. So we are well on the way. Uh, we're getting that approved and through the wickets now. And then once it goes through the proper board approvals for the POI, we will start implementing that. Uh, and we're looking at maybe end of this year, early beginning of next year to really start getting after that uh, to provide the community the multifunctional non-commissioned officer uh, in order to you know, lead these troopers. Julie, if I could just pull on the string just a tad bit. So yes, you may. in the very beginning, she talked about TAA and the cuts that we have according to TAA. I think everybody knows that TAA is really the pacing item for the Army. Uh, it ebbs and flows. And so that as TAA cuts occur, we really got to put ourselves in the position to where we can respond to that uh, appropriately without having to do a lot of movement around. And we already have those non-commissioned officers. Uh, that we can kind of really plug and play because they've been educated and trained through the PME uh, to be effectively do their jobs. So. Okay, great. Uh, Sergeant Major Hester, uh, you talked about the critical required capabilities for 2040, the concept that AS AFC is developing. Can you expand on that a little bit more for us? Certainly, Julie. So um, there's, you know, concept required capabilities. We've developed uh, really about 31 concept required capabilities that we think 
um, the Army of 2040 ha has to happen. Um, I will say I don't want to get out in front of uh, General Rainey on, on these uh, 31 critical capabilities, but but you can, I mean, you can think about it uh, from, uh, you know, autonomous systems. You can talk about it, you can think about it from uh, human-machine integrated formations. You can think about it from the ability to um, um, sense deeper, understand faster, deliver the right payload when, when needed, and then as as and then understand the sustainment tail that has to that has to follow that, so that we can regenerate right. and and then uh, move on to the the next objective. So, you know, fully integrated with regard to technology, fully integrated with regard to dot mill PFP, and understanding all the requirements associated with being able to be able to deliver that. Uh, from a concept-driven perspective in, in 2040, 2030, really 2030 and beyond, but really into 2040. So, um, and then, of course, it's, it's also driven uh, to a certain degree by, uh, by the modernization priorities. And you think about long-range precision fires, you think about um, the, the ability to do deep sensing, uh, the ability to change the way we, um, the way we fight from a um, a maneuver and fires perspective. So these are all driven by concept. They all have a required set of capabilities, and we're working to, to develop those capabilities and to deliver those capabilities on time. Because cap only delivering a capability doesn't necessarily give us the capacity to do right. that from a systems and systems perspective. No, 100%. I agree with that. Um, Sergeant Major Jones, the predictive logistics uh, in capabilities uses network sensors that automatically feed data from platforms into a common operating environment, um, enabling sustainers, much like we've been talking about, to monitor, anticipate, and distribute at the point of need. How does predictive logistics work just fundamentally within the National Guard? I really appreciate the softball right up front, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that here was, for it. That's a really good one. <laughs> No, um, so predictive logistics across the National Guard is, you know, one advantage we have, we learn to operate in a very decentralized manner from birth, right? Every company is basically scattered around a state. You may only, you may only be around your actual battalion uh, two, maybe three times a year. Mm -hmm. So um, getting in, so a lot of our logistics NCOs get into that uh, predictive logistics pretty early, but our systems are not where they need to be, as uh, Sergeant Major Sellers was talking about. There's a lot of improvements when it comes to actual automated systems that are going to report, you know, you know, AFATADS did a great job of sending back logistics reports if you hand jammed all the information right. at AFATADS and sent it. I think the idea being the, the more intuitive and more automatic requests because, you know, as we talk congest, uh, contested logistics, you know, from a National Guard perspective, hey, we, when we talk the homeland, we're looking beyond even the post because, right. you know, we're looking at mission assurance and governors needing help pro uh, protecting critical infrastructure in addition to that uh, thing. So um, it's a similar we're all basically needing the exact same assets that uh, my colleagues are talking about working on. And I really, uh, our, our guardsmen will quickly pick that up and, uh, and run with it. That's one thing that uh, is really good about the National Guard is things like, uh, I, I hate to go back to this because I tell people, so during COVID, West Virginia, completely X'd out of the federal distribution program because we're used to running that type of thing. And we had a guardsman that ran global logistics for Mylan Pharmaceuticals. Mm. So there's always somebody in the system right. that we can rely on that really adds a whole different dynamic in building that uh, transformation. And no, that's great. Yeah. I appreciate that feedback. I would, if we can just stay with the contested logistics for a little bit. Sure. Um, and I would, for any of the panel members, we recently did a, a course at the headquarters on contested logistics. As a career intel professional, I know the importance of securing uh, what we need from fort to port and port to fort. And so uh, I would really like your input, um, Sergeant Major Sellers, and any other panel members on why contested logistics is a thing and what does that mean operationally on how you combat the threat um, every single time that you're trying to get equipment where it needs to be. Yeah, I think that's important because if you cannot get out of the joint strategic support area, 
and move equipment off the installation down to the port, then we're never going to get to the objective. So it's, it's important that we understand data, what it's trying to tell us, uh, how to visualize that data, how to form it and use it so that when we do see it, we know exactly what we're looking at. So there's a lot of different initiatives that we have working through our you know, sustainment center of excellence that help us understand data and data analytics and get into the baseline uh, so that people kind of see data the same way. And then what do we do with that data when we do it? You know, back in the day, uh, somebody made a joke earlier today, we were eating lunch, they were talking about the early 1990s and how long ago that was. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in the 1990s of that army and what that really means. Um, and we used to, you know, kind of have scientific wild guesses about what the law packs would be uh, on the board before we sent the law packs out of the BSA and, uh, and out to the, uh, you know, the four objective areas. Well, I think we got to do better than that because you know, we used to take the trucks, load them up, and then whatever the, the infantry platoons didn't need, we brought back. And I don't think that was a good use of commodities. So now, as we take a look at days of supply, how do we have to use data in order to inform our decisions so that we can make sure that we got the right load going to the right place um, at the right time so the equipment's not being wasted. Yeah, can I, if I can just pile on a little bit with what uh, Sergeant Major Sellers was talking about. So I think gone are the, are the days with regard to contested logistics where we can move mountains of material, we can stage mountains of material forward. I think we're going to have to be more predictive and understanding the need um, at, the, at the tactical edge, right? So that's delivery on time. That's our sensors on, you know, if you drive a Tesla in here, um, your Tesla can tell you, uh, the computer system and that can tell you a lot of things about what your car is doing and what it's not doing. Our combat systems need to be able to, to, to do that also. And then they need to be able to send that back to the sustainment enterprise so that they can deliver sustainment on time and in the right amount. So we don't deliver 30,000 gallons of fuel and we only need 15,000 gallons of fuel as an example. They don't deliver 50,000 rounds of X when we only needed 20,000 rounds of X. That is precision sustainment. That is contested logistics. You know, we have a contested logistics CFT that's looking at these systems, looking at how we can make them more data centric, looking at how we can be more predictive. And then as we're predictive, we're going to deliver the right amount of sustainment, regardless of the class of supply that it is, um, while the, the maneuver formation on the move needs that. Um, and then, you know, to get away from having to move that mountain of logistics from one place to another place. Yep. I, you know, that's critical, uh, very important, and I think it's one thing that doesn't always get highlighted, but especially in the line of work from, you know, people expect, units expect to get supplies when they need to, and how do we collectively keep contested logistics from being a problem and then eliminate the threat as much as humanly possible? Uh, Sergeant Major Harris. Sure. Uh, so, you know, from... Well, I so, had something for you, but oh, okay. No, go ahead. I'll ask. The <laughs> only thing I was going to say is, you know, r really from the, from the TRADOC perspective, um, you know, as we look at contested logistics through, the, through our G2 lens and able to see those things, um, that's really helping us, one, with how we adjust POI and lessons plans, mm -hmm. how we inform CTCs, warfighters, and all these other things so we can train in order to get after contested logistics. Um, to make sure our people are right. And it also informs the force design, both people and equipment, right? As we look, maybe things change because this requires more or maybe less to streamline to get the logistics to where they need to be, less people, more equipment, so on and so forth. But the force design part of the team looks at that through the doctrinal perspective to determine how do we help also deliver the force that commanders need. So I was going to add that. But go ahead. What's your question now? Transforming contact. So we're going to pivot real quick. Uh, there, you re recently completed two TTXs um, led by TRADOC uh, about how the brigade fights and how the division fights. Can you talk about that, about transforming in contact and what that means, um, how TRADOC participates in that? And then I would invite any other panel members to, um, from your perspective, what that looks like inside of your organizations. Yeah, thanks. I, I think really the answer to that question is kind of really what I just said of how we look at it from the G, G2 perspective and the force design and how we right size, you know, the kind of finding formations and the doctrine in order, in order to get after that. Um, from my perspective and what my focus on, 
um, is again, it's really that educational piece of that, of how we transform in contact to make sure we have the right validated, educated, and trained leaders to lead through that problem set. And if the problem set is contested logistics, our sustainers uh, and, our, and our combat forces need to be able to know how to secure. They need to know how to, you know, our sustaining forces need to know how to get, uh, you know, equipment and people uh, and supplies to the locations when they need to do that. Um, and so things that we do and we train is we look at, um, you know, transformation and contact. One, we kind of already did that from the, from the educational perspective and like you, not to go back to COVID, uh, but we had to do that in COVID when we turned, you know, Common Core into virtual learning syn synchronous training online in order to make sure that our NCOs still got their PME education. Uh, and then we went through iterations of that, of how we let certain units, you know, pipe in from a deployed area through a DSAT system in order to come into the classroom to train and educate. And so with all this, no matter what we do, we can't stop our professional education uh, in what we're doing. There's a time and place for it. And so as we transform our PME in contact, as I talked about earlier, about being adaptable, flexible, and building readiness, uh, we got to be able to take a look at how can we still provide professional military education that vets and validates our non-commissioned officers, officers, and warrant officers, uh, because we're working on all three cohorts of how we're able to do those uh, to make them adaptable, flexible, make them exportable. How do we bring in um, potentially constructive credit, right? We already have a constructive credit program that maybe we take a look at and say, is there a way to expand that in order to give the warfighters on the ground, you know, the ability to, to do those kind of things. So that, that's, you know, from my lens of where I really hang my hat on a transforming contact, it's really how do we get our educated leaders out there? How do we continue our promise to train and educate leaders for the Army? That's great. And especially because if the leaders don't understand what transforming a contact looks like, then how are they supposed to train that next generation so that they understand their role in it at Echelon? Uh, Sergeant Major Jones, how do you define precision sustainment inside of your organization? And because you don't see your subordinate units in the same manner that Compo 1 does, how does that translate inside? So, uh, really, Precision, precision. Wow, that's a tough word yeah, for a guy word. from West it Virginia. Is a word. You gotta slow it down. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for the teleprompter that's translating my accent up here. I messed <laughs> that one up. But um, no, precision. Good lord. Um, sustainment in a precise way. There you go. Is, there you go. <laughs> cheating. Cheating isn't trying. Yeah. Just go the other way. No. So it's always. Um, Actually, the National Guard is really uh, exceptional in the way we sustain our equipment and the way that we provide that and predictive sustainment as best we can now because we have limited resources. Right. Limited resources, limited time. So our, the way we manage our sustainment processes have to be more, uh, more precise all the time, that we take the best care of the equipment that we have and that we maintain it at a high level because... You know, as I talked before, uh, most of our modernization will and has and will continue to be through cascading modernization. That's not a bad thing. Right. A lot of that equipment sets are still far and above that of our adversaries, and we can, as long as they stay interoperable, we can put them to good use. But um, the challenging thing for sustainment, our precision sustainment for us is. Um, you know, the division headquarters and the brigade headquarters, it's one thing when you talk battalions at a state level, they could be scattered across six or seven different states. So when you look at uh, a division like 34th ID, that's our Army of 2030 priority unit, um, you know, those, those brigade combat teams are scattered all across the United States and their subordinate battalions may be in different states even than that. So monitoring at the div division level is really all about spreadsheets, unfortunately, mm. where if we can continue to get more automated and, uh, and be able to provide that back, that would make a, that, that would save us a lot of time as a, as a National Guard and really as a, a whole army. No, great, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. And I think it helps us, you know, the, the, the soldiers and leaders that have grown up in in Compo 1 understand the challenges and the significance of precise sustainment within inside of your organizations <laughs> to make sure that it's done properly. So there you go, I got you. Uh, there's a couple questions from the audience and then I'll go back to some of the other uh, areas that we're, we're covering. Sergeant Major Harris, is the Army considering bringing back technical ranks? 
<laughs> There's a couple zingers in here for you guys. That, that's, that's great. Um, sh short answer, more than likely not. Uh, uh, it, so, so you got to take a look at what, what we're actually looking for. What we're looking for is soldiers and non-commissioned officers that are skilled, uh, that are qualified, that are certified in, you know, their, their MOS. And we have some, you know, MOSs out there, soldiers that, A, they always want to be, and I hate to, you know, I always use AFC as an example, and I apologize, Brian, but it's, if you get a data coder, sometimes a data coder just wants to be a data coder for 20 years. I think there's other ways to approach that, to ha let a data coder be a data coder for 20 years and bring back additional ranks. Um, there, there's a lot that comes with that. There's, there's funding, there's the palming of that funding to pay for that. There, there's just different things that go with it. Um, short answer, not on the docket just yet, but it is a topic we talk about. Um, it is something that we talk about regularly. Um, so hopefully that answers without being too short. I didn't add, it, it's someone's. Whoever asked that, or, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, there's a really good one that I'm gonna close with from that same card, but I'm gonna move on to the next one. Uh, along with General Rainey, Sergeant Major Hester, how are you informing all you are doing with our uh, SELs attending the Joint Keystone course? Uh, first off, I don't, I don't know that we're doing that as well as we should be. <laughs> so Maybe that's um, why it was asked. We, uh, we probably do need to improve. So I, I think that um, from, a, I'll use Project Convergence as an example. Project Convergence, Army Experiment, um, led by Army Futures Command, but really there's a lot of joint flavor in this. This past year we had, you know, all the services took part in Project Convergence to try to figure out how we're gonna really fight as a joint force in the future, and then what capabilities do we need to be able to do that in the future. So um, I think um, what I would take away from that question is, is we need to take the lessons learned from Project Convergence, and then we need to uh, boil those down to what's applicable for our senior non-commissioned officers, and then we need to make an, uh, make an attempt to get into uh, not only just Keystone, but I think we probably need to do some of that in, inside our own service with our, our nominative leaders course. So um, I'll, I'll seriously or certainly take that as a do out and, and see how we can, we can take at least some of the lessons that we're learning from Project Convergence and we can deliver that in, uh, in the, you know, at the Keystone course from a professional military education perspective across the joint force. And then frankly, I, the, other, the other part of this is, is, is within Project Convergence and the other services, I, I think that uh, they're, they're taking a lot of lessons learned and so we probably need to, probably a, be a good opportunity for the SMA to talk to, to the SEAC and say, hey, these are, these are some things we've learned across the services. These are things that are applicable for, for each individual service and then uh, for, you know, from a joint service and non-commissioned officer's perspective. Great, thank you. Uh, Sergeant Major Sellers, our installations are power projection platforms. What is AMC doing to improve and enhance these capabilities? So I think there's a couple of things going on in that area, right? As we get out and start doing some assessments of our facilities and infrastructure, um, we really got to understand where we're at and where we need to make those investments at, right? Um, railheads, those types of things need to be improved. Where we have our project uh, projection platforms from, uh, the infrastructure that helps house our soldiers uh, on the installation, uh, where they would push out from, all those things are looked at and how we're going to improve and make those investments through our facilities investment plans. Uh, are being analyzed constantly, right? MCOM does a phenomenal job at getting that done for us, but you know, it's a balance in, in terms of resources and, and where we put the priorities at and from the uh, commander perspective. Okay, great. Uh, this question is, precision sustainment should include the ability to reduce demand. Uh, please discuss what and how the Army is looking at in demand reduction, and I would like to pose that question to both AFC, AMC, and the National Guard. Someone go. <laughs> you said you were going to have easy questions, Julie. These are from the crowd. Mine, so, mine aren't easy. Okay. So I think, um, you know, from a demand reduction perspective, I think what, what, are those, what are the sensors that are out there to be able to help us see ourselves, right? And then what data do we collect from those sensors? And then how do we streamline that, da that data um, to, to the appropriate level of, of sustainment? So um, we could be, it could be a company sustainment node, it could be a, 
uh, an FSC sustainment node, or it could be a division support area that we're, that we're talking about. So we just got to be able to continue to, to be able to understand the requirements as far forward as possible. And then we have to be able to deliver that data on time and inaccurately to the sustainment enterprise so that they can, they can deliver the supplies or the commodity um, when needed and, and at the appropriate time and place. So my favorite commodity, right, class five, and you know, you can say class three, two as well. Demand reduction on some of that. Uh, I think Sergeant Major Hester hit the nail around the head when he talked about the sensors. So we have fuel, and we got sensors on fuel blivets that's actually calculating the fuel, so we don't have to take a stick out there and measure fuel uh, density any longer. So we know that we can have, you know, refuel on the move uh, as we're moving forward to contact. You know, we have our PLSs that are out there carrying the helmets and, and the, the hippos. Uh, all that stuff matters in terms of the technology. Uh, the, the one area that I get concerned with as we start to advance technology uh, within some of these areas that we have right now is to make sure that we have the right soldier that has the aptitude to continue to carry that system along the way. Because if we don't have the right people on there with the right aptitude, we don't reassess the right people, then the technology is gonna outpace us as the individual human. So, I mean, there's a lot of sensors that are out there. Uh, I think the sensors that he talked about will help us read that back in the, the BSA uh, to know how much we need to push forward uh, when the time comes, whether that's fuel, water, ammunition, or food. Uh, there's things out there that can help us measure that through technology uh, through data analytics to be precise uh, on the objective. Can I just add two, two things that I didn't think about um, with regard to demand reduction? So as we introduce robotics, I think that there's a, there's a huge opportunity for demand reduction there as, as we push supplies forward on robotic vehicles mm -hmm. and then we, we um, retrofit casualties or other or other things that need to be moved back to the, su to the support area that's a demand reduction initiative that, that can also work very well for us um, I also think that um, you know we're, we're looking at what industry is doing there, there are a number of tools out there in industry I, I can use an example Walmart Walmart doesn't do inventory in their stores you know with a person and a clipboard right um, they do it. It's it's all a digital inventory, and they and they know the commodities that they need based upon that digital inventory. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if if I was hoping to predict something in the future, as, as you know, we, we sort of look at this for demand reduction perspective. Why should we not be able to have a robot drive the motor pool at night and collect data that tells us all the things that we need, so that when the motor sergeant comes in in the morning. You know, he's got her, he or she has that right there on their tablet, on their computer. And we've got a class three leak here. We've got a, you know, we've got a flat tire there. So these are all ways that we can reduce the, the demand uh, for sustainment, maintenance, and other, kinds of, and other kinds of things that we're trying to do across the force. With, yep. I think you know, that's new all that stuff, Brian, is making us more precise. Yep. Did you have so uh, you, you talked about that, uh, Sergeant Major Hester. It's really interesting. I went and visited a Procter & Gamble plant in eastern uh, West Virginia, and there's not a soul on that floor. It's all robotics, loading pallets, stacking, inventory, and it looks like something out of the future rolling around out there. It smells like dryer sheets. It's really weird. <laughs> but, um, no, the demand, if you look at historically, we're at a really uh, – we're at a really unique point in history. Um, I was reading uh, uh, General Petraeus' book, Conflict, and you know there was a thing in the, a statement in there, so don't hold me to it. Um, in five days, Russia fired more artillery rounds than in the entire UK uh, stockpile. So when we talk about demand reduction, when we look at large-scale large -scale combat operations across potentially multiple theaters, our ability to be to be to have demand reduction and be right on those sustainment systems is important because when you have uh, contested logistics all the way through, you know we're not talking U-boats uh, sinking transport ships in the Atlantic during World War II. We're talking about cyber attacks and everything, you know, from from the United States forward. 
you're just layered and layered. So uh, as we as we spoke, and uh, you know, my colleagues have ar articulated much better than I. Um, we got to be right when we push things. We can't be wrong um, with you know how much ammo we got. And we we grew up in an environment where you always asked for more than you needed, right? And hoped you would get less. Mm -hmm. We've got to start the culture now of you know not just the logit we this is not a logistics problem this is a this is a warfighter problem down to squad level of understanding exactly what you need to fight a certain fight and not asking for more and expecting to get less because that's what causes all that excess and that's something culturally we can start training you know from TRADOC all the way through the units and organizations up to you know up to the division level that's a great point thank you so much for that reminder of of being uh, good stewards and not just continuously asking for things because we always have uh sergeant major harris in regards to transforming and contact, what areas do you see that require additional emphasis in time and PME, and what areas could be de-emphasized for the Army to be the premier NCO Corps that it is? Yeah, thanks. One, I, I think, you know, our NCO Corps and our PME is always going to be the envy of the world just because of the time and the resources and the money we put against and the emphasis that our commands, uh, both commanders, uh, enlisted warrant officers, that we put, you know, we put towards our, our professional military education. I think what we really got to take a look at and what, what I'm looking at right now with the team is, you know, what are those things that we could train in TRADOC that only TRADOC can train? Um, we think about 22 years of conflict, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, we pulled a lot of things into the institutional environment, uh, a lot of lad-based training going on, and, and we took that on. Um, and so what we got to be able to do is one of the charges that we were given uh, working with Forcecom and Sergeant Major Holland out there is, is giving, getting back some of that time in PME. And how do we take some of those uh, unit-owned responsibility training things that we do and give to units uh, to manage, to assess, uh, to validate, to certify uh, that'll give us time and space in PME to really build reps and sets to deliver what we want our non-commissioned officers to be when they leave their PME, their, their resident PME course, whether you're you know, a sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant first class, uh, mass sergeant, sergeant major. And then you got to remember that you know, and, uh, the, you know, the two phases of the common core and the proponency that everything that we teach within TRADOC is the baseline on the echelon of the grade plate about, you know, that you're about to enter. And so for common cores, the baseline, all of the non-commissioned officers, the same. On these things that we deem uh, that come out of our regulations of what we want a non-commissioned officer to be at grade plate. When you get to the proponency phase, we're really getting after the ICTs and your specific proponent by the MOS that you currently hold to baseline you in that and how we baseline you in that through repetition, through sets and figuring that out. So we, we really got to take a look at what are those things that we're doing that's not allowing us to get after the reps and sets that we need to get after an event. Um, there are things that, that may be antiquated in there that we teach, um, that we don't do in the operational army or is not in a commander's met anymore. And the question has to be, do we still teach that? Uh, or is that a unit responsibility to teach where I can harness more time back, TRADOC can harness more time back to get reps and sets on something different uh, that's may, that maybe matters more to you know, the command, maybe that's unit training management. Uh, maybe that's, you know, whatever that task may be. And so as we transform and contact, really working hand-in-hand -hand with Force Comm and Sergeant Major Holland and the team there, uh, really determine what can we pull out of all the phases of PME or keep or maybe add to, and we have to go back and ask for more time uh, to be able to do this, right, uh, to get the reps and sets that we need to promise in our delivery or deliver on our promise uh, to really, uh, you know, give back the validated and educated trained leaders that our commands need. I think, um, I, I know when I was at the cyber school, one thing that I ran into, <clears throat> excuse me, was the operational uh, requirements and the institutional need. And so um, since we're on this topic, I think it's really important to you what the Army needs at, inside of an organization from a PME perspective versus what they want. Yeah. And how do you balance that within TRADOC? And I would say any of the panel members, if you want to jump in, please do. Yeah, and I'll definitely love it. It is, it is a balance by what you want and what you need. Um, and and I, will, I will say this is that there are things that were mandated we have to teach in PME. It's, it's outlined in the NDAA, it's outlined by our Army senior leaders uh, through Army directives that say you will teach this in PME and there's, there, there's, there's no strain left or right, which is good because um, there's good things in there that we must do. 
And then we got to balance and find out and say, you know, what is it you want us to teach and how long do you want it to be in an institution? If you're okay with Staff Sergeant Harris leaving your formation for five months or six months to get after an output that you want, then awesome. Give them to us for five or six months and we'll teach them. Of course, we need the money and the resources to do it. But that's a long time for a squad leader to be away from their formation. And so what we got to understand is, again, we're baselining this and we only have them in TRADOC for a finite amount of time. And then what are, what's happening when they get back to their organization and their unit? So you come to BLC, you're in BLC for 21 days, and we're going to baseline you on common core uh, activities um, and, and topics in our POI and lesson plan. It might be three to five years till you come back to a PME institution. So what's happening in that three to five years? That's incumbent upon us, non-commissioned officers, officers and warrant officers, to continue to reinforce the training of what was taught in PME at your organization. We have to be able to do that. Because then they're going to come to ALC, and we're going to get them for 14 days of virtual synchronous training for Common Core. And depending on their CMF, they might go through two weeks of proponency, or they might go through four weeks of proponency training. But then we're not going to see them again in a PME until maybe five to seven years. So what's happened in that five to seven year mark of the reinforcement training that's going on? So again, the balance is teaching what are the things that you need us in TRADOC to teach to baseline, and then validate when they matriculate up to the next echelon, but if re the real question is, is what is the emphasis that's being put back into the right. units to reinforce what we've taught in the POI right. uh, to, to the soldiers and the leaders that we're teaching? So hopefully that helps. No, that did. I think uh, it's always like, okay, well, I can teach all of this and you will get them in three years. Uh, and that was the challenge of, it, or it's the warrant officers, officers and NCOs responsibility to train at Echelon and then you send them back to me for the baseline to your point. So yeah, no, I think that's a really important discussion point in that um, everyone that hasn't really had the opportunity to, to work in TRADOC, which you should, uh, it's great for professional development, um, but that's one thing that I think the Operational Army doesn't always understand and gets frustrated with the institution. And so trying to balance that I know is, is, very, is very difficult. Um, for everyone on the panel, what does migrating from anticipatory to predictive logistics look like within your organizations? And we'll start with you, Sergeant Major Jones, and come down. So what does it look like now? <laughs> sure. OK. What, or what would you like it to look like, maybe? I mean, I, I, think, we, I think we've talked a lot about it. Um, you know, I, I really liked what Sergeant Major Hester said about, you know, there, there's levels of things we haven't even imagined yet that save time and effort and uh, ensure additional accuracy. Um, you know, we look at AI and uh, human machine interface and things like that. And, you know, there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of hesitation across the force, 100% uh, to integrate those things. And I don't really think it's because of the you're taking my job away type attitude. It's more of a, you know, just uncertainty. And, you know, again, talking about culture, um, we all grew up in a, an environment where if you wanted it do, done right, you did it yourself. And I'm sure the first thing we're going to do when we really get to those levels is have three or four checks on the, on the output of those different systems to make sure they're accurate. But um, I really believe that uh, th this is the way of the future and it really just, it allows us to use those limited resources in other better suited areas. Um, so for us uh, in the National Guard, absolutely um, any way that systems, you know, personnel are something we don't have access to very often, you know. Um, just a, what, 40, 48 days a year, essentially. But um, so anything that's automotive or, and uh, intuitive and that provides, uh, provides more accurate data that we don't have to utilize our soldiers' valuable training time is, is exceptional for us. Sorry, yeah, so for us, it's pretty much like set in stone, right? I mean, so, and, and I mean that tongue in cheek, but, um, you know, for, for TRADOC, we pretty much know what we're going to do at the ATCs and the COEs as we train. And so our, our, our the sustain of the supplies that we need and things we do um, are pretty regular, and we stay pretty good with that. Now, how we help out with that, though, is, is really in our training of our leaders as we go through. So um, for those that, don't, that, that, that haven't heard, and I think I talked about an AUSA uh, at the end of last year, 
uh, is the launch of Forge 2.5 that we're now teaching all of our drill sergeants and that our drill sergeants have to go through. And that's a series of events and there are three uh, field training exercises they go out to, Hammer, Anvil, and Forge. And really what it does is it allows us to validate and certify our drill sergeants uh, before they go out to the execution. Um, and it keeps them relevant within the field. And this allows us to add things like this in here. So we can put a, a, a mission plan in there that says, when you go out to the forge, which is your final FTX, um, you're gonna be contested in your logistics. And you have to figure out how you're going to account for your ammunition, your food, your so on and so forth. Because when the drill sergeants go out there for the forge, uh, the final FTX, they are the squad leader. They are the platoon sergeant. They're not a drill sergeant at that point per se uh, because we want them to model what right looks like to that brand new private that's about to go to the first unit of assignment so they can see what a staff sergeant, you know, their sergeant first class is supposed to do. And when it comes to this, we're able to put these kind of into the lesson plan and the mission planning orders to say, if you're going to go out here, this is how you do it. So we take it more from the training aspect to our leaders, uh, our drill sergeants and our instructors as they go out and do it. Yeah, Drew, I think that's a great question. Um, so as I thought that question a little bit, I think over time, we really just kind of talked about being anticipatory, uh, how you have that gut intuition about when something is about to go low or wrong. You kind of anticipate the requirement. We train that in our you know, logistical cohort for quite some time, but that's not an exact science, right? That's kind of intuition. How do you train intuition? It just comes through experience. Now, I think, we gotta be a little bit more deliberate in that process as we cultivate that environment and that climate. We really gotta talk about like what the Sergeant Major of the Army really talks about, being brilliant at the basics. And for me, fundamentally throughout the sustainment community, I think it kinda goes to understanding war fighting, that's maneuvers and fires. Teaching our non-commissioned officers and soldiers war fighting, functions and making sure they understand that so they can be more precise in what the information that they give to the commanders to make those informed decisions. So I think it's an institutional change and it's going to be a culture change uh, throughout our, you know, our profession for a while. But as more as we understand how the warfighter operates on the battlefields, whether it's through CTC rotations, uh, what have you, that's where you're going to be a little bit more precise in delivering some of what we need to. Yeah, so I think that um, it, it's a systems approach. I don't think you can disconnect um, sustainment um, from uh, maneuver, intel, protection, fires. I think it's, it's a system of systems. So it looks like that to me, and our, our, our multifunctional logisticians are able to, to provide the supplies and commodities that we need across the warfighting functions. But I also think it's... Um, somebody wrote this down for me, and I appreciate it from my team over there. It's, it's stealthy, it's resilient, it's fast, it's distributed, it's agile, it's adaptive, it's in a constant state of motion, it's hot, you know, and, and most important, it's survivable. But, but, you know, so they wrote that for me, and I'm very thankful for them because it sounds really nice. But, but what I would say personally, you know, what does it look like to me? It's, it's data-centric, it's sensor-enabled, um, it may be um, AI or machine or robotic enabled. Um, it's delivered on time at, at the right time, and then it reduces the stress across all of the warfighting systems. Now that's great, and I think uh, it, regardless of where you what, what where you fall in the army, whether you're a combat arms an enabler, a sustainer, uh, being able to know and having um, something data driven that is anticipatory, where you know. Sam Major Sellers, you talked about, you know, all of us, we grew up in the Army in the 90s. I mean, anticipatory was you went to your barracks NCO and gave them an empty toilet paper roll so that you could get another one. Um, whereas, like, now we can actually, you know, that, that was how we anticipated things back then. And now we have data-driven ways to anticipate what we need from a sustainment perspective, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Dusty's dying down there. He liked that, that analogy. <laughs> Sergeant Major Harris, one of the Chief of Staff of the Army's priority is the profession of arms. And you talked a little bit about what you're doing inside TRADOC with um, strengthening the profession. Um, what is TRADOC doing to get after the precise uh, profession of arms portion? Yeah, thanks. We're, we're actually doing, there's a lot in this space, as you would imagine. Um, 
Some of it is one of the charges that was given to us was removing ambiguity in our standards um, and some of the things that we do. And so, you know, TRADOC, we've been charged and we're taking a look at um, ARDA PAM 670-1 about our grooming standards, some of these other things, remove some of the ambiguity in order to provide the right answer uh, for leaders to be able to find to say this is how we can hold people to a standard uh, of what our regulations say. Um, and, and that's an arduous task. I mean, if, if you take a look at it, there's been uh, five army directives, three mil per message, and a bunch of whole, whole stick, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other things that have kind of changed some of our standards over time. And so we just got to get those in the right place, uh, kind of get rid of the old army directives and mil per messages and get them into the regulation and, and go. But part of that is also providing the top cover, and, and, and the chief used those words before, but it's really empowering our officers, warrant officers, and non-commissioned officers to make those on-the-spot corrections, knowing that their leadership will be there. Um, third ID General Norrie, Major General Norrie, you know, he, he has a policy that he uses in Third Infantry Division. I talk about this everywhere I go, that does exactly that for his leaders. It's a withhold policy, um, you know, for certain investigations or complaints that come up, and he is going to be the purview officer to say we do or we do not investigate something. And that is where he put his leadership out there to make sure that if his leaders are doing the right thing, the right way to correct a deficiency, that they're not going to lead in fear. And that's kind of part of it, right? Lead in fear of, of being investigated or something else. Because so, we cannot have an investigative culture in our leaders. Our leaders need to lead and hold the standards and not worry about those things. And generally, you can. We all can without a problem as long as you're doing it legally, morally, ethically. You know, you don't violate somebody's safety and we're doing it the right way. There's always a right way to talk to somebody and, and, and we got to truly understand that. Um, the other thing we're doing is we are, we're, gonna, we're starting from the ground roots as we talk about, some of you may have heard of like life skills training in, in IET, uh, AIT, OSIT, and our PME. Um, really what we're talking about is foundational training. Um, and this isn't kind of soft skill things, but this is, this is, you know, how are we gonna get these young Americans that come join the military to inculcate, you know, to our values, our norms, our morals, um, relatively in a, in a fast manner and understand, you know, what they may have done before they join isn't acceptable anymore when you come in. And we do a very good job. Our drill sergeants do a very, very good job, you know, at doing this. And when we talk about foundational training at Echelon through AIT, OSIT, BCT, and through levels of PME, um, it's getting after respect, right? It's getting after how to treat people correctly. It's getting after... Um, resiliency and how to have conflict resolution and, and, and how to speak up for yourself and have that, you know, intestinal fortitude, that moral courage to say no. Um, in, the, in, in the basic training environment, we do that all the time. Our drill sergeants do it with holiday block leave when our soldiers go home for Christmas break because we want them to have refusal skills, to be able to go home after they've been training for, you know, four to five weeks, go home and tell their friends, no, I'm not going to get drunk or no, I'm not going to go touch those drugs because I'm in the army, like I'm training. I got to go back and, and do what I said I had to do. And so to be able to have that courage, that moral courage to say no uh, and to do some of those things. So we're continuing to work that at Echelon as, as we go um, and, and we put that in PME. And of course, as it goes in PME, you learn different things at Echelon, right? Now you're at the kind of the managerial level, so you need to know how to teach that, right. not let me tell you how refusal skills. And so uh, as we work through that POI, we're going to start doing a pilot here soon, um, but not getting out in front of my boss. I, I would I would I never do that. propose Don't that you that. get out in front of General Brito, <laughs> nor would I advise that <laughs> uh, for any of you. I I would like to to sit with this for one moment. Um, what particular is the National Guard doing initiative wise initiatives wise um, to strengthen the profession that you've seen? Apparently, that was still on. You, the, you're you're um, always on. What's that? <laughs> you're always on. Oh, okay. Well, that. <laughs> That's good to know now. <laughs> no, the National Guard, um, you know, we, we have the exact same issues, so just less time to really resolve them. Um, the, uh, you know, getting people from compliance to commitment for us has got to be a more rapid thing. So uh, it's a really, uh, for, most, for most organizations, the way that we try to professionalize those soldiers um, is really about the why, not just as, a, as an underlying tone for the organization, but as a direct training program, right? Not just understanding 
what they do on the uh, as on the war fight, but everything they do below that for the citizens and you know because the truth of the matter is the the face of the army is the national guard because any weekend across the entire country um, in every community, every county, every town, there's people wearing that army uniform, Absolutely. and they're representing everyone in this room, everyone on this panel, whether they've ever been Compo One, Compo Three, Compo Two, it doesn't matter to the American public. That is what a soldier is, and we are very mindful of that in the National Guard, and very um, uh, we we know that that's we know that that's the case and everyone dealing with recruiting issues and um, we don't want that to be our our fault essentially because of the way we represent the great soldiers across all three compos so um, it's a really directive and really uh, uh, focused event to make sure that we build that professionalism in even if it is in small doses so that they take that profession of arms away and know that, you know, this was really the foundation of this country was, you know, citizen soldiers standing up against, uh, you know, oppression to gain freedom for everyone. So um, once they realize that, you know, we're the oldest service as a militia, essentially. <laughs> but, um, so that's a humble flex right there. Yeah, that's a really <laughs> humble one. Um, but uh, once they understand that, what the meaning is and, and how we're all working together and really building one great one army team, uh, some of them get it, some of them don't. It's right. just a, it's a common factor for everyone. <clears throat> no, it's, that's great. And I love that you brought that up, that every time that they go into the community, they are the face of the army. They're also recruiters. Yeah. And, and I, you know, the time that I spent in TRADOC from drill sergeant to SAR major um, at all the echelons, whenever I would, you know, soldiers would go home, be in uniform in the airport, I would tell them there's a community that's never seen a soldier. And so this is the first time that they've seen an American soldier in uniform in the airport, and that is what they're going to uh, attest that the United States Army is, so act accordingly, or I will assist and insist when you get back. Uh, just, just for those that wore a drill slime badge, you know what that means. <laughs> um, so I, I think that this is a good pivot because there's a couple questions on here since we're talking about recruiting. Is um, what for all of you? Uh, what are we doing? Uh, what are you doing? What is the Army doing to preserve the all volunteer force for the future? Um, I'll, I'll start, Julie. Thanks. So. Um, first, it's our number one priority, and our chief and our secretary and our sergeant major of the Army have been very clear to us that, re that recruiting is our number one priority, uh, and an all-volunteer force is, is our number one priority. So, and it's also our asymmetric advantage, right? Our people are our advantage. Um, it's not our tanks, although they're fantastic. It's not our helicopters, although they're the best in the world. It's our people, and our people bring the will to win, and if you have the will to win, um, then um, you're, you're going to win. Um, we, we've seen that in Ukraine. You could, the Ukrainians are probably um, less, less trained, less equipped, but they have the will to win and they've been able to resist. So the other part of it is, 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 is the continuous communication that the one thing that the Army does better than anybody is we build leaders, right? From the, the, from the very beginning, when a young man or a young woman leaves their home and becomes part of our profession, we talk about the profession of arms, um, we start building them as a leader. First to lead themselves, then to lead a small team, and then a larger team, and a larger team, and so on and so forth, right? So, so it's really about what are we doing in our community? So from, from an Army Futures Command perspective, um, I'll give you a recent example, South by Southwest, big um, tech innovation, music, and, and uh, theater uh, conference in, in the Southeast down in Austin, Texas. The Army went in as a, as a um, signature sponsor this year for that event. Um, and frankly, we brought the whole entire Army to include our secretary down to, to Austin to, to talk about the Army, to speak about what the Army's doing and what your Army, your American Army is doing for you as a, as a citizen and as a, as a member of our society. So, um, you know, we're continuing to, to do that outreach through recruiters, um, through our engagements with academia, with industry from Army Futures Command's perspective. Um, and we tell people, hey, you should be asking um, everybody that you run into, are they interested in being part of our team, being a soldier in our Army, the, the, the best and one of the oldest professions. And then the other thing that, that we're continuing to do is, is message that our Army is, is innovative. 
Um, and you may, you may choose a partic one particular job in the Army, but there may be an opportunity for you to develop yourself in a number of different ways from an innovative perspective. So these are some of the things from a Futures Command perspective. We're supposed to be the innovators, so we do talk a lot about innovation. We do um, uh, speak to industry and academia a lot, and, and we're, we're continuing to message that uh, our doors are open and we're, we're ready to take uh, America's young men and women and turn them into leaders. Yeah, I think we've all doing that pretty much the same way, um, depending on where you're located at, right? So from an AMC perspective, you know, this patch is globally. It's all over the globe, everywhere you go. Um, so I think our major subordinate commands do a phenomenal job at getting out to the community, you know, talking to JRTC, talking to ROTC, colleges in general, uh, industry, and recruiting the talent that's out there across the board. I think we've changed the way that we've uh, gone out to the public. Um, I'll use an example of what CECOM does up at uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds. They just kind of open up the community and the installation and invites the public in and allow them to see the Army firsthand. Uh, and there's things that uh, civilians don't know about the Army. There's this whole technology side that they introduce to them that they may be interested in. And so just showing them a different side than just what they normally would see on the TV commercials, what they are starting to do holistically across the board. And if you think about AMC and where they're located at, they have some strategic points uh, around the globe where they touch major points of the community uh, in central locations. You know, if I think about uh, what TACOM, Tank and Automotive Command does, and they get out there in the community and do things regular, uh, on a regular basis. It's, Constant touch points is where we didn't go before. Um, I think that's what we're doing a lot better than what we did before in the past. Before, it was just in a high school area, kind of set up in the corner. You kind of waited for the kids to come to you and talk to you if they were a recruiter. But now we have more of a presence in all those areas that people are walking around and just want to know more about the Army. Um, and I think this uniform right here, it does a lot. It attracts people to the uniform. They think it's neat. They like it, they think it's professional, and they, more, they want to know more about it. So I think that's changed uh, the dynamic and it's helped us a lot in that space in the recruiting realm. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. And, and really, from, from our perspective, and I'll keep it on, based on this question of how we retain the all-volunteer force, is Future Soldier Prep Course, which TRADOC started about 18 months ago. Um, Future Soldier Prep Course was designed and built as we saw that we missed the sessions by you know, X amount, which we all are tracking. And so to this date, about 18 months, we put in 17,243 uh, soldiers, future soldiers have gone through the future soldier prep course with 15,700 about to go to their first unit of assignment. To put it in a context, that's four combat brigades that we never would have had in the Army if they didn't go through the future soldier prep course. And so they go through two, two lanes. They go through an academic lanes to try to raise their base score so they can certify you know, for an MOS or CMF to serve in the military. And the other one is motivation and physical assessment to get them to meet our physical requirements. Because we're not changing any standards. We did not lower a single standard, but what we found is we had soldiers or we had um, volunteers that were right on the cusp of getting in, they just couldn't do it. So we give them a, a contract, we bring them down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for up to 90 days and we put them through either, uh, either one of those two programs uh, to kind of push them through. And so we're, we've already expanded. This has been so successful, it's in NDA language. So it came out of this last NDA, and it was really to all services now will do a future soldier prep course or a future soldier course of something that they, their service chief deems necessary for, for their, you know, their department. Um, so this has been very successful. So for us to keep that, think about that, four brigade combat teams worth of soldiers we yeah. never would have had if we did not That's train. That's an amazing metric to continue to foot stomp, for it, sure. It is, and I appreciate it. And so, and so the graduation rate is 96.7%. That's pretty big. We have a 23.4% point raise uh, within six weeks of soldiers that go through. So that could be a soldier that maybe barely qualified or, or was on the cusp of qualifying, but even if they did, they only would have qualified for a certain MOS. With a 23.4% uh, point raise, now they could qualify for something they really wanted to come in and be in the Army. But we're teaching them good habits. We're teaching them how to learn. We're teaching them how to retain information, build the capacity so they can, they can understand those and get physical. We, we average 1.4% body fat decrease per week. 
in a soldier that goes through or a future soldier goes through the physical fitness program. Why? Uh, because we're teaching them proper nutrition. They're actually getting out and exercising with physical therapists and, and athletic trainers that are there watching them to make sure we do it healthily because we don't want to hurt them. And those that do a trip, the, you know, the 3.3%, that's all right. You know, we, we still, what we did is we put better Americans back into society. Maybe, hopefully, we changed their life to think about how they live their life differently or how they could be a better person for themselves and their family. So, to be honest, it's a win-win situation. All 100% of them are a win-win for us. And I think that's, that's how we took that on, um, you know, to make sure that we retain the all-volunteer force. Great. Yeah. Severance Jones? Yeah, that, that's been a tremendous program. You know, I, I was so happy when, when, we, when we launched that program because I'd argued for years, we can't say that we're the premier training institution in the world and not try to help get them ready because, uh, you know, COVID crushed academics for, for a lot of, we're gonna, we, we have a generation there that we're gonna, that we're gonna have to uh, accept as, as kind of needs in some additional assistance to get up to the level to meet that minimum requirement. And there's some other things, ASVAB, uh, ASVAB, I'm looking at getting a calculator in there because that's how we do business now. But, um, you know, I, I think recruiting recruiting's a really interesting dynamic, right? So being in a state, um, I will tell you that our civilian counterparts highly value soldiers. I mean, they, they call our offices all the time wanting to hire every National Guardsman. You know, do you know anybody that ever touched a uniform one time? Uh, because they want more of that. I'll tell you where I think, so the value of what we bring to the table as an institution, I think, is known at certain points. What really, really I focus a lot on is, is how are we taking care of those soldiers when they're in uniform, right? Uh, it, it's, it's straight NCO business, not just how we train them, how we handle, you know, their day-to-day -day operations, but when they leave, when they go out the door through retirement or through the end of a contract or, you know, another means, the way that they leave this organization, you can have the best recruiter on the planet. You will never out-recruit someone's sphere of influence. Mm. So one soldier that comes in, that gets out of the, the army in any compo, who gets out and does nothing but talk bad about that compo, you will not out-recruit that sphere of influence. We're a family business, all the data shows that. Mm. And if we're losing that small population that we focus on, um, we're, we're, we're not gonna be able to maintain it. But I think everything data-wise that we're seeing, we're doing a great job Everything's ramping back up. Future soldier. Pre I sit on the rack for recruiting for the National Guard, so um, no, I think everything's moving very positively. The telling our story thing, getting yep. more, getting more of our Compo One counterparts out, and uh, and demonstrating who we are as an army to our everyday citizens, and not letting that one or two people tell a story that's not an accurate portrayal of what we do as an organization. I think we'll we'll, we'll keep the vo all volunteer army for long past all of our lifetimes. That's the goal. I, I, I agree. I think all the data that I've seen is that we're trending upward for sure. And it's important that every single person, whether you're a soldier for life or you have separated, whatever that looks like, but to your point, it's telling that Army story is incredibly important. Whatever that story is, everyone has a story that is unique. It's compelling. It's interesting. And it can come from all facets of life and this business that we're all in or and have been in, it, it's something that can change your stars. It can change your class in life. It can change your trajectory um, if you apply yourself. And so that part of the Army story just needs to be continuously told uh, because it's really important to sustaining an all-volunteer course and getting past these recruiting challenges that we've had for all the reasons over the past couple years. Uh, so. This is another pivot. Back to logistics. Uh, Sergeant Major Sellers, can you discuss specifically how we are incorporating contested logistics in uh, training exercises, warfighters, CTC rotations, et cetera? And Sergeant Major Harris, are, are we incorporating 
contested logistics into exercises um, within TRADOC, and how are we doing that? So I'll start with you, Simon. Yeah, I think a great example is that what we just saw in PC24, um, where we took some things out there to NTC straight out of PC24 and, and put it into the box and challenged uh, through technology exactly what we probably would see uh, on a modern day Army battlefield. And so all the stuff that AFC is doing um, in terms of you know, the contested logistics space and then being able to incorporate that into real time and the CTC is, is powerful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thanks. And, and, and definitely in our PME, right? And right. so when you go there, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, Triple C or whether, you know, it's, it's uh, SLC or MLC, as we talked about, our practical exercises when we do things, it's one of the things that we have to make sure uh, that our war fighting function when you get into these practical exercises, one of the things it's, it's a... Uh, that they have to account for, right. or the contested logistics, and then how are you going to do that? How are you going to provide on-time logistics when it's needed with efficiency at the right times? Absolutely. And I po the po question was posed to Sergeant Major uh, Sellers and Harris, but Sergeant Major Jones, for the National Guard, uh, are you incorporating any contested logistics scenarios inside of exercises? And if so, how are those being exercised? I mean, they're definitely, you know, it's definitely a focus, but the you know, is it a pre prevailing focus? I doubt it, just to be frank about it, because um, the way, you know, last, last year, for example, I went to visit a unit and they were on a FOB trying to do operations and we basically kicked them off and said, look, you get, so trying to get that old mindset and start looking at large scale combat operations, you know, when you've got a generation of people that have never touched it, you know, the, the people obviously at this table remember, uh, you know, pre-9-11 where large-scale combat operations mm -hmm. was, was the primary thing. But uh, we have to remember that our 06s and below and 07s, a lot of them came in after, you know, after we converted to war on terror. So, um, yeah, it's, it's moving forward. We're talking con contested logistics and getting it, trying to get that mindset because everybody's still kind of stuck in that mode where, um, hey, you just order it and it's going to show yeah. up. And, you know, it's all about getting the order right, not worrying about how it gets there or where it's coming from. So. Absolutely. So in regards to large-scale combat operations, uh, for sustainment on the move, uh, Sergeant Major Sellers, starting at the Joint Strategic Support Area and post camps and stations, how are you incorporating sustainment on the move with LISCO inside of those? Yeah, I think that has a lot to do with um, how we're going to change our doctrine. Okay. Um, in terms of how we fix arm and fuel forward, uh, rather just just sitting in the BSA. There's a lot of things, we kind of touched on this earlier, where we have to be more agile uh, and responsive straight to the point of need up front. Um, and there's going to be a lot of times where we just can't stay stagnant, right? Because if, the longer you stay there, the more you make yourself a target. Right. And so sustainment on the move is going to be one of those things where it's going to be uh, continuous in motion. And we're doing a lot of things uh, up front uh, forward of the lines. Okay, great. So, Major Hester, um, when we're talking about a deliberate transformation, what is AFC doing with that in regards to approved uh, MOD priorities? And if you could talk a little bit about what that is. Yeah, so, um, so with regard to deliberate transformation, so, so that's, that is in line with the six modernization priorities, that's in line with, our, with our, our, our CFTs and what our CFTs are working on, whether it be um, next generation combat vehicle, whether it be soldier lethality and, or, or so on and so forth, really those, those six priorities that have been consistent over the last six years. And, and frankly, um, with regard to deliberate transformation, we've had a lot of success here. So probably more success than we thought we were going to have. And then that's created some dilem dilemmas for us also, right? So how do, you, how do you then fund that success? And how do you make trades that you're going to need to, need to be able to make with regard uh, to the modernization priorities? And I, I think it, it sort of goes a, a, in line a little bit with what we're talking about with regard, for, both with, with regard to continuous transformation and, and then, of course, contested logistics. So. Um, as we're having success in the, with, with regard to modernization priorities, then we have to start thinking about, as we deliver that, 
what are we taking out of our formation so that we optimize uh, appropriately? So what, what legacy equipment is in our formation? Jimmy talked about uh, the war on excess, so to speak. How do we right. get that excess legacy equipment out of our formations? How do we um, optimize the enduring fleet? Um, and because we know it's going to be part of our, um, our go-to-war kit for, for a, at least for a minute uh, right. going forward. And then how do we deliver that modernized equipment in a meaningful way um, where, it, where it's delivered to um, the appropriate formations at the appropriate time? What we don't want to do is we don't want to deliver um, modernized equipment as people are going out the door. Um, right. That doesn't allow us to, to get after the training requirements. That doesn't allow us to get after the organizational requirements, so the, the, leader, the leader development. It doesn't help with facilities management. There are all those things that, that we have to look at from a dot mil PFP perspective um, with regard to deliberate transformation. So, so you know, the message is, is we're having a lot of success here, but with success makes us have to think about the trades that we're going to be able to, to have to make hard decisions on um, with regard to, to, to funding uh, and then clearly it's it, it's in line with what is it legacy is it enduring is it is it modernized and then and then where are we going to go from there and how that is, how does that impact um, our war fighting capability absolutely uh, so audience we got to most of the questions there is one that a soldier from atec had if you can stand by i will get that to the panel member uh, thanks again for all the participation today and to the panel members uh, for your uh, your participation and candid conversation on so many complex topics uh, that the Army is going through and that also the focus of this panel was, which was transforming contact and precision sustainment. <laughs> yeah, just slow, just slow it down, Sergeant Major, just slow it down. Uh, enjoy the expo expo exposition, ongoing panels, and fireside chats over the next three days. Registration is now open for the Army 10 Miler. AUSA is the lead sponsor for that. And please join us for AUSA's annual meeting in October in D.C. Enjoy your day and be all you can be. Ooh. Ladies and gentlemen, a few admin notes as we close. Again, let's give another round of applause to our NCO panel and their moderator. As Julie mentioned, this concludes the programming portion of today, but the exhibit halls will remain open until 1700 hours. So please join us there for some more networking. And we will begin tomorrow morning at 0730 for coffee in the concert hall foyer on the sides where you were this morning. And our first session will begin promptly at 0830. Now for all of those of you in the, in the room who are not members of AUSA, shame on you. And you can fix that by visiting our AUSA membership booth in the main floor. And don't forget to stop by the AUSA store so you get a gift for your spouse at home after you return home from Global Force. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your attendance today. Be all you can be. <laughs>